So the good news is we have our website back up. Um, it's been moved on to a more robust server. But rightly so, our technology folks are um, a little concerned about having everybody go just glom onto the site. So we're going to ask that you not log on to the Rethink website. Um, and then after the symposium is over, then we will feel much better because people won't be going and grabbing the same proposal at the, at the same time. So again, we thank you. So our, our presenters will be presenting from the website, but they're all ready with their thumb drives in case for some reason we need that to, to happen again. So I'm just going to ask that the uh, next set of presenters sort of queue themselves up. Um, and what we'll do is, is that um, we will then be going through the remaining proposals um, that we have today for the symposium, and then we're going to follow that with a, a discussion, and then some next steps as to what as to what will be going on. So I'm going to now turn it over to the next presenter, and you can continue to eat your lunch, and remember to continue to tweet. And because the website, we're asking you not to go to the website, go ahead and tweet your comments. And then after the symposium, you can go to the website and you can actually enter your comments um, for each individual proposal. And one more thing, and that is, it's really important for you to be commenting on these proposals. Remember, this is a process by which we need your input. And the we being those individuals who have put the proposals together but also all of us as, a, as an institution. And so if there's something about a proposal where you say, wow, that's a great idea, or what the heck are they talking about, it's really important to be able to get that information back. Um, and we'll do that through your comments. So thank you. And should I say something about this? OK. OK. <laughs> Thank you for this afternoon coming here. Uh, I'm Jerry. I'm going to talk about an idea to increase the access to engineering education, but also to increase the opportunities for people who are not necessarily going to pursue engineering. It's called the Engineering Pathways Project. We have a uh, classroom and a curriculum that uses some of the ideas that Jeremy talked about with the Scale Up Project. We have tables. People bring their laptops and their gear. And during the middle of last term, I asked these four sections of this class, what three words would you use to describe this uh, curriculum to your friends? And so challenging was up there and difficult is up there, but so is fun, interesting, and hands-on. So why is it interesting and fun? Because people, the students in our class, use tools. They use machine tools. They use hand tools. They work on hardware that motivates them to understand the underlying problems, the mathematics, the physics, the computer programming, et cetera. So we use tactical, tactile, uh, real projects to help motivate the, the other stuff that you really need to be successful. Students work on teams. Here they're, uh, the project is uh, a little desktop fan that they made. And uh, this group is testing a pump that they made just from raw materials, a pump of wa uh, to pump water. So we. Um, I found, this is uh, in information from the Center for Advancement of Engineering Education at the University of Washington. They found that uh, on a big longitudinal study that engineering persistence isn't so much a problem. The problem is getting into the curriculum. Engineering has the lowest rate of inward migration. Folks have to say, start at the freshman level and move forward. So we're trying to address that with this Pathways Project. Um, we're building pre-engineering pathways. Uh, to, that would appeal to three groups of students, those who are curious about engineering. What is with all this tech stuff and all the money that can be made and the uh, gear that you can get? So we want students who are curious about engineering to w have a way to explore this. We want a way for students who are already committed to engineering but who may not be really ready with the math and the uh, computing uh, tech, uh, tools and, and knowledge. So this is a way to get them started and also to help high school students, folks who uh, may not have even moved to Portland or may not have started uh, classes here. So we're the same, the same techniques, the same courses, the same uh, uh, curriculum is useful for all three. Here's a picture of the engineering curriculum, and it really could be any curriculum, but the engineering curriculum is very 
very structured. You really have to move sequentially through a lot of this stuff. The first pathway is the high school, community college, and other PSU disciplines pathway. Uh, we provide a broad overview for people who are curious, may want to continue. We would provide a gentle introduction to those who uh, are committed but may not really be prepared. And the hope is, and this is not necessarily the only hope, but the hope is that this would be a pathway into the freshman engineering course. We deliver this via hybrid um, uh, pedagogy, and we provide asynchronous access to the laboratories. One of the key ideas of all this is you need hands-on stuff. So I've got a bit of a hands-on thing here. You can go to the website and see. Uh, I assured Sona that it wasn't going to blow. It's merely a temperature indicator. It's got blinky lights. What's not to like about that? Um, but here's an example. I cooked this up yesterday afternoon. Um, students could build this kind of thing and then go on from ex uh, exploring not just the technique, the, the, the assembly, but how, how, how would I use this in, a, in a, an experiment? So we're going to reframe the classes, uh, use technology projects, because that's where the fun is. We lead with the fun. We lead with the stuff that you actually make. We're also proposing something called a RUC, a regional open online course. So the idea here is that folks could be taking these courses in a distributed fashion, but to do the hands-on stuff. Either you, you've got a lab uh, in your high school or in your community college to do this, or come on down for a weekend and knock out three or four labs, and let's, let's break down the uh, boundary that says you have to be at PSU all the time. So a second pathway is at the uh, junior uh, level where students apply to and enter the curriculum. Uh, we'll be using um, uh, uh, competency-based assessment and self-paced study that allow people to approach this discipline from a variety of backgrounds again. Um, so both the freshman and the junior level pathways uh, involve technology delivery, but it's about technology itself. And we want to make sure that it's not just for engineers. The idea here is not to just create more engineering students. Obviously, we're interested in that. But the way these uh, pathways are structured, folks who want to explore this idea, maybe they don't want to take it as a career. Instead, they can get a taste and uh, see why it's so much fun. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rowana Carpenter. I'm with University Studies, and today I'm going to talk to you about our idea for engaged online pathways. My collaborators and I want to rethink the experience for the 90% of our undergraduates who go through the upper division cluster and capstone portion of the University Studies curriculum. We want to build on our strengths in our capstone program and creates a sustained emphasis on career preparation, community engagement, and reflective practice. While our current program would, st would continue to be an option, <coughs> excuse me, we want to create engage these engaged pathways to address students who ask us why they have to wait till the end of their academic career at Portland State to have the powerful engaged learning experience in their capstone course. And we want to serve students who want to continue engagement beyond the capstone. We want to increase the number of students who have opportunities for internships and undergraduate research projects and other applied learning experiences. 
we want, and we plan to use technology so that these experiences uh, complement rather than conflict with uh, students' others re other required courses. The pathway begins in our upper division cluster. <coughs> Excuse me. In this case, um, I'm using community studies as an example. Our cluster coordinator for community studies is one of our collaborators. <coughs> Students would start their pathway in this cluster by taking two traditional courses, for in this case, geography and urban studies, but then they would take an engaged or an experiential online course. This student could take an internship that she discovered through our collaborators in the academic and career services. This student undertook a research project supported by our partners in the library. And this student uh, proposed and completed a cleanup project for a community garden that he discovered through our communities of practice. I'll come back to that in a minute. All of these students would meet together in an online course where they, um, where they support each other, they reflect on the skills that they're, um, that they're developing. And um, yes, the next step in the pathway would be that we recommend thematically aligned capstones for these students so that they continue <coughs> their experience with the community issues that they were working on and they strengthen the career related skills that they're starting to build. The experiential learning course, cluster course, and capstone course are related to online communities of practice. This, this website is a community of practice for social justice that is under development right now by one of our capstone faculty members. It's a digital, digital space where students, faculty, community partners, and alumni meet uh, to work on pressing issues in our community beyond the boundaries of our formal curriculum. So this is, this is exactly what we talked about this morning when students um, learn when they're out in the community and that learning isn't, doesn't happen only in the classroom. We want to provide spaces that allow for that learning to continue in a sustained manner. These communities will magnify our impact in the region by drawing a broad network of people together to work on pressing issues. And they also represent a unique opportunity to keep alumni engaged, not only with the university, but also with the, the causes that they become passionate about in their capstone course. A specific feature of these communities is a hybrid mini course. These are one and two credit elective courses that students can use to continue the um, community engagement that they started in their capstone or they could use it as a bridge between their cluster and their capstone course to continue to work on um, uh, career skills through their internships. Through the experiential learning course, the uh, capstone, the hybrid mini course, and the communities of practice are engaged online pathway. Students will develop skills in thinking critically about complex problems, in working collaboratively to set priorities, in facilitation, and in naming and framing their own skill set so that when they leave, they've not only had a more coherent experience in their upper division um, general education requirements, they're also well prepared to contribute as workers in our complex economy and as active community members. Pressure is really on when you're a computer scientist coming up here to get your talk to run. Um, so uh, I'm going to show low rent slides that fit in my pocket today because I know I understand fully exactly what's involved in getting a server to keep running in an event like this. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a group project 
that we're proposing called Accelerated Learning Through Interaction, or Technical Infrastructure for the Flipped Classroom. So there's been a lot of talk with MOOCs about using technology to do distance education. And my perspective is, let's use technology to do interactive in-person education. So folks here in this room probably know a lot about the flipped classroom already. It's obviously not a new idea of my own. Just a couple of quick references here um, that I find informative. The second one, the Wisconsin project in particular, sort of recognized within the computing field that uh, having folks go off and do all their programming and then sit in static lectures was maybe not the best way to go about things. So this is part of my motivation. So uh, I believe in the flipped classroom model in computer science in particular, uh, my own experience, that shows us that uh, students can watch videos on YouTube or other online sources, but uh, we can really enhance educational experience if we pay attention in the interactive time that we have for them. And for PSU students, getting them into a lab means having it in their schedule uh, and attendance required because their schedules are so disparate across the different students, you'll never get them together otherwise. Um, so we do target a wide range of disciplines, although the work is informed by my own um, experience in computer science. So in particular, I sort of bravely set out a few years ago um, to start running some sections of the operating systems course uh, in this manner. Now, I did not have the lectures online. I actually still kept a lecture slot per week, and I added an additional three-hour in-person laboratory. And here's the shocking part for computer scientists. We put them in a lab and closed them off from the internet. Uh, it wasn't clear if I was going to kill off some students by doing this. I really took a big risk here. It's a good thing I have tenure. So uh, anyway, so, um, so they can't use their cell phones or their laptops, right? They're at a computer, but what that computer gives them access to is now limited. And so this gives us full interaction. That is, that we, we decide what materials they can have as helpers. But other than that, they're going to have to ask the person next to them or instructor in the room uh, for any information that they don't know. So first of all, it's a really rich way to learn what is required or what kind of um, things students are looking up, which right now is inaccessible to us. Uh, and we found a really positive results in the learning side. And so we really brought up in a very efficient way the programming skills across the board. Um, so what we're proposing today is not just a computer laboratory. We want it to be more general purpose, but to say now imagine the classroom and how can we make the classroom be more like this specialized laboratory. And I've broken it down for the talk into two parts. One is, you know, what is my computer or my station in the room going to be showing me? And so when I do interactive work, there's some things that I always do. I want to know the students' names, but I can never do this, especially the first couple weeks of class. Right now I have... Uh, I don't know, 75 students, right? So first week, I don't know all their names yet. So why don't I have their photos um, accessible on something um, along with their names when I get my class list? The second idea would be the background information. And I'm not talking about something scary here, but to say, uh, you know, do they have the prereqs? Did the student transfer in? Do they have anything, you know, they're in a different major, anything like that? But I do want another exam if I want to know questions that they're consistently getting stumped by so that when I'm explaining something to them, maybe I can, uh, that can help me. And also, I want to be able to call on students, and I want my computer to help me do that. So I want my computer to tell me if a student is not raising their hand. I want to know who I've called on more so that I can even out the environment and make sure that everyone's getting a chance to participate. Um, in terms of the now, so that's the instructor part, and now here's the student part, right? So, you know, if I had a picture in my talk, which I don't, it would be a picture of a chair with a red circle and a line through it, right? So the chair is no longer adequate student uh, stationed in the classroom. So the problem is the students recognize this. They bring their laptops and their phones. They're reading email. They're texting each other. It's completely not what we want. Right? So I want a controlled electronic environment. I want the students to be able to respond to quiz questions in this sort of in-class voting manner, uh, but I don't want them to be able to be texting people outside the room. I also want them to be able to do peer review. We do this now, but we do it offline, and they you know, mail in their uh, reviews and we post them on the web. I want them to be able to do group work and have some aspects of that group work be coming back to me in my station in the front of the room. And finally, I want to be able to record certain aspects of the work that's being done in the classroom. Um, 
So uh, that's my brief pitch, uh, just the instructor station, the student station, stamp out the plain chair, but don't do it with individual uncontrolled laptops and mobile phones. Let's use technology to really make a good use out of that time we have interactively in person on campus. Thank you. I'm John Gallup, and I'm here to talk to you about how to put all of PSU's classes online uh, in a year. <laughs> a modest proposal. Traditional online presents some real challenges for scaling up online education, particularly online degrees, because it requires completely separate classes that uh, have, usually require extensive modification of the curriculum to make it work online. To do this for every single class we offer would take a lot of work initially and also require essentially a doubling of the faculty to teach all these new courses. Uh, it presents a chicken and egg problem because until we have large numbers of online students interested in doing online degrees, it doesn't make sense to create with traditional online classes all the classes we need to be able to offer an online degree because even if a department, for instance, choose to have every single one of its classes available online, that's not sufficient for someone to get a degree because they need classes potentially in almost any other department on campus as well. What uh, we're proposing we call virtually in class where online students instead would join conventional classes, would join in-person classes. And they would do this. Uh, imagine there's a large screen over on the right here, a computer screen, all the online students would appear on that screen. Each one would have a separate video feed, a little face you could see, so that they can see everything going on in the classroom. Everyone in the class, including the students, can see them. They can ask questions in class, and I, as the professor, can ask them questions. This, if it were available technologically in all of our classrooms, would make it possible for online students to join any class they wanted to on campus. Um, and once that's possible, it immediately makes online degrees feasible, which require the possibility of taking a huge number of, of different classes. Now, the technology to do this is actually quite modest. You need a new computer screen to show the students, and you'd need three webcams, which all could be mounted on the podium here, one showing the professor talking, one showing the rest of the class, one showing the blackboard, if that's what you're using. Um, the video technology also exists and, in fact, is free. Google Plus has a, a video chat feature called Hangouts, where up to 10 students can have simultaneous video chat, which is what would drive the feeds of the online students coming into the classroom. And according to the OIT people I talked to, Google is probably going to increase the capacity of the system soon. Now, what the students, online students would see would be four windows on their computer. They'd have one large window, which is the, um, the presentation that's being uh, discussed, and three smaller windows, one showing the professor talking, one showing the rest of the class so they can see the student questions and what the class is up to, and then a final one showing all the other online students. Now, <clears throat> this makes it feasible to put online a lot of classes which may never make sense to put online in a traditional manner. Uh, because most of our upper division classes, our graduate classes, have quite small enrollment. It's difficult financially to sustain those as, online, as separate online classes. But in this way, 
there's no requirement that you have substantial numbers of online students to have online participation in these classes. Um, and if there are classes in which lots of people want to get online, so it exceeds the system capacity, that's a class where it makes sense to have a traditional online class anyway. Now, the main limitation of this actually comes from what I see as its great strength. This gives students a virtual in-class experience, quite different from what you typically get in an online course, but it means that it's, um, it's synchronous, that you have to show up at the time of the conventional class, um, although if you don't want to, you can watch the video feed later without the possibility of classroom interaction. The, um, this uh, also, I think, plays to PSU's strengths, because the things that are distinctive about PSU are the, uh, often the things that are taught in small upper division graduate classes, our specializations in sustainability and green technology and other areas, um, are often occur in the kind of classes that are difficult to make online, but would be feasible with this system. It's also very intriguing for the possibility of foreign students because they could have a US in-class experience, which is usually a primary motivation for studying in the United States, without having to come to the U.S., without having to immigrate, without having to pay U.S. living expenses. Um, and uh, this is a simulation of what Google Hangouts look like and uh, sort of a simulated classroom. And uh, this isn't responding, but it shows uh, we pretended to have two students talk about why they wanted to do this coming from Vietnam and another one who works in Bend who um, is able to do this uh, periodically during the workday, but couldn't actually commute here. And now the screen seems completely stuck. Uh, so in conclusion, um, <clears throat> the, uh, this system would require quite modest resources, not very expensive to set up per classroom, um, but it would allow the possibility of having students in class, um, online students in virtually any class on campus, once the hardware was available, um, and uh, make, make it feasible uh, online degrees, which is difficult for me to uh, conceive of how else we can do that in the near term. Thank you. I'm Beth Lloyd Poole with the Institute for Sustainable Solutions, and I'm part of a faculty and staff team consisting of Jennifer Allen, Daryl Brown, Thad Miller, Angela Hamilton, and Jacob Sherman. Our proposal is for an undergraduate certificate in sustainability, and I'm going to briefly describe the why, what, who, and how. Why it's needed, what it is, who we're partnering with, and how you can connect with us. So to begin with the why. PSU has established itself to be a leader in sustainability over the last several years and is currently well positioned with strong support from upper administration and multiple departments to strengthen its sustainability programs even further. More and more universities are either <clears throat> creating sustainability schools or offering sustainability majors and we feel the time is right for PSU to take advantage of its leadership and really institutionalize this trend in a unique way. Employers are increasingly seeking employees who can bring sustainability concepts to existing positions. PSU's approach, not just to create another academic silo with sustainability, can be leveraged to provide students with a clear path to add a sustainability credential to any major field of interest, while also taking into account the changing landscapes and new ways in which students are learning and engaging in their education. Given this context, we have an opportunity to build on ongoing efforts to better define and assess our campus-wide sustainability learning outcomes through the development of a program that could potentially impact all undergraduate students. So the next is the what is it? We are proposing a competency-based certificate for undergraduate students that has traditional and non-traditional pathways for program completion. 
By competency-based, we mean developing a program that is not focused on checking off courses or seat time, but one that is focused on assessing if students have achieved and can demonstrate the identified core competencies of the program. In terms of program completion, we don't take a one-size-fits-all approach and instead want to provide a diverse set of options that is representative of our student body, more responsive to how students are learning, and connects to problems and situations that we currently face in the world today. The program will have traditional pathways such as PSU courses, courses from other universities and community college, and online courses. A good portion of our student body is transfer students, and we will explore creating an attriculation agreement with PCC so that students can have a seamless transition programmatically to PSU, even if their time spent between the two schools isn't as straightforward. Non-traditional pathways for program completion include giving credit based on demonstrated competencies for MOOCs, prior learning, community, and work experience. These pathways fully utilize PSU as a living laboratory and encourage and acknowledge real-world learning. They also allow for greater flexibility for older students and will help keep program standards high while preventing it from becoming overly burdensome. While we have not fully developed the specific details in how we would operationalize such a program, we feel it's key, key for PSU to have a unified and consistent approach and are actively seeking out other proposals and partners that align with us. And this kind of gets us to the who. Uh, an example of a partnership is um, we have partnered with Rowana Carpenter and her team's proposal related to ePortfolios, as we think ePortfolios are a potential tool for competency assessment, and a single portfolio of a student's work would be reflective of the interdisciplinary nature that is inherent in sustainability. We're also partnering with the, excuse me, giving credit where credit is due proposal, focused on giving credit for prior and concurrent learning experiences to create a community of interest and combine talent as we all move through the challenges associated with competency-based initiatives. And lastly is the how. If you're interested on working on this proposal or aligning with our team or just joining us in this community of interest around competency-based initiatives, please contact us at sustainability at pdx.edu. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Rob, and um, here to report, uh, already we've had, we've, we have had a breakthrough in this project, we're actually, uh, we've actually started talking to biology. <laughs> so, uh, uh, let me, um, uh, let me get a little serious, I'll try my best to stay serious. Um, this is really a great opportunity, I want to thank the provost uh, for allowing us to have a voice in, in these important issues. Um, we all know that the cost of delivering higher ed, uh, high quality uh, higher ed uh, rising at a time when you probably heard the economy is not doing so well. Or you heard something about that. Anyway, uh, this understandably is uh, rendering community colleges and MOOCs uh, highly appealing to students that seek value and affordability. It's totally understandable. But in chemistry and biology, PSU has something unique to offer and has a great strength. We have intensive laboratory classes and advanced research experiences at a level not available at PCC or currently in any uh, MOOC uh, type format. Okay, it's this hands-on experience and personal interaction with an expert in, one's, in the field 
where students can create knowledge, take part in creating knowledge. Now, to me, I'm just learning this flipped uh, jargon. To me, this is a good example of a flip. Instead of uh, students just learning, now students can be creating knowledge. I mean, that's what research uh, affords. That's a, a great opportunity uh, that we can afford students that uh, no other local uh, post-secondary uh, institutions can, can do. Of course, there's OHSU, but they don't have, um, uh, they don't have undergrads. Um, we want to build on this strength, but there's a lot more. And the way we're building on this, the strategy that we're using is a, what's called a competency-based approach. And that's something that can't be gleaned in just one course. This is a curriculum outcome. It's the outcome of a process where one imparts skills uh, um, to our graduates that enables them to perform at the highest level, perform and function independently in, in professional practice, in grad school or in the workplace. And everything just about that I'm going to tell you uh, is going to have input from industry partners and prospective uh, graduate mentors. Uh, and so we really need to address this problem on a number of levels. This is the largest growing segment uh, job-wise in the United States. It's, and the US ranks 28th globally in placing and maintaining students in post-secondary uh, STEM. Here in Oregon, uh, fewer, than 11, fewer than 1,000 students graduated with a STEM degree in 2011. But the Oregon companies project by 2020, they're going to need 39,000 STEM employees. Now, I know you really don't want a lot of people moving here from California. Right? So anyway, this is a problem. So good news. There's some real opportunity, hopefully, and there's a new collaborative life science building uh, that we want to be a major part of. Uh, we see this as a way to expand our, wonderfully, uh, our wonderful existing partnership between the universities, expand research and teaching opportunities, and create new employment opportunities. Uh, and this will allow to, uh, you know, with faculty, uh, uh, planning new curricula and the integration of doctoral programs and shared courses in a seamless manner. Uh, and again, to have state-of-the-art uh, laboratory experience. Again, to impart uh, something that's unique here at PSU to our graduates, uh, which is, uh, okay. Um, we're envisioning new pathways, accelerated degrees, five-year a bachelor's, master's degree in uh, biology and chemistry, uh, certificates, uh, PSU solutions in chemistry or solutions in biology is going to be an important first step in developing recognizable signs of exceptional specialized uh, achievement. In order to accomplish these goals, we're going to need significant improvements in both the introductory and the advanced uh, level curricula. And let me go over this. Briefly, our STEM scholars of practice are going to be students that are going to uh, self-assess. And we're going to have a database called PSU Squared. That's PSU's portal to science for undergrads. It's going to be a database of, uh, that's going to interface with prospective employers. Uh, it's going to enable social networking between the students um, and enable mentoring. Uh, et cetera, and so on. But we're going to have this available to high school students who can self-assess and place out of general chemistry and introductory biology classes, thereby directly shortening the time to graduation. Those students that place out are going to, um, let me skip this, I'm not going to skip this. The students that place out are going to be advised uh, into uh, a new advanced laboratory course uh, where students will work on a professor's research project. This is not what we do now with uh, research where you go to an advisor and just work for them. This will be a class, a small class with a TA, 
uh, where students uh, will have a class where they can actually work on real world problems and gain uh, the necessary real world skills, job skills. For instance, uh, it's very exciting. There's some very exciting work going on. Uh, students can work on cures for malaria, uh, detect early detection of cancer, uh, and so on. And these will be small advanced lab classes for exceptional students. And we, the last thing uh, that I can, I'll mention is a lot more in our proposal, if you're interested. Uh, chemistry and biology sh share six terms of intro labs, and we're going to develop, along with biology, a new joint lab program to enhance STEM training that will shorten the time required in the intro lab. We are going to combine the intro labs in chemistry and biology. This is better reflective of modern science, uh, collaborative science, interdisciplinary modern science, uh, and again, shorten the time to graduation. Uh, and again, get them used to uh, an interdisciplinary approach. And in the large lecture classes where uh, biology is going to work with us, we're going to flip what we do, and chemistry has done very well in our workshops, and have peer-led team learning or Pogel style uh, uh, instruction in larger, in the large lecture classes. We're going to flip that from what we now do in the workshops. And eventually, and we're going to study uh, whether it's better to put those online uh, or to have them done face-to-face. -face. The instructors that do that, again, can get certificates. The, the, uh, the students that help, uh, they can get certificates in uh, chemical ed or, bio, or biological education. So, <laughs> so I want to thank, again, thank you again for articulating such um, clear, clear problems uh, for us to work on. Uh, I can't do anything much about this last one. I hope, I hope you guys can help us fix that. Uh, but I think we addressed almost all the rest of these. I'll address this one Friday. Hi, I'm Karen Strand, and I'm from the music department, been at Portland State a while. I'm very excited about today. I've revised my talk in my head at least 100 times. <laughs> Maybe that's an exaggeration. But it's so exciting to be in here in this collaborative environment, listening to people with their ideas. It makes me think of more ideas. What, what I'd like to have happen through our project is have music students and any other um, students and faculty with an interest in a high technology media studio work together and rethink how our disciplines intersect and how we can get students and, and faculty collaborating for new ideas and new solutions at Portland State. Um, our proposal is really nicely encapsulated here on the slide that my colleague Steve Gantz made. Steve Gantz, besides his many technical skills, is also a very capable oboist. And the heart of the proposal we have here is um, to have a, a high-tech, high-resolution media studio where I could teach some of the details critical to learning to play the oboe. My colleague Evan Kuhlman from the Oregon Symphony could do the same for PSU bassoon students. These are very arcane, detailed skills that are very hard to work into the student's um, study day. Um, this studio obviously has many other uses. I think they're nicely encapsulated here. So let me take you to the low-tech demo. No, I'm not going to light up. Um, <laughs> what I have here with, in what looks like a cigarette case is a, um, a set of oboe reeds. If I'm backstage getting ready for concert, I have a certain amount of low-tech technology that can crash on me too before I get out in front of the 2,000 people at the um, Keller Auditorium, for instance. Um, this reed is essentially a mouthpiece for my instrument. It makes a distinct sound. I try not to get too close to the mic. <laughs> now, it sounds like a duck call and probably more like a duck call than it should right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a selection of these, and I can tell simply from 
the set of pitches they make, the amount of resistance, uh, how hard I have to blow to get those pitches to speak, what those pitches are, um, how easy it is to sustain it or not. I can divide the sound. All of those tiny detailed sounds are very important to whether or not I could stick this in the end of my $10,000 beautiful musical instrument and actually sound good or get fired. Um, or, or at least send the audience running out there for a refund. <laughs> so my PSU students, who are some of the smartest people on campus, deal with this challenge all the time. I think it is easy to forget that in the arts, it isn't just music or double reads, but in, in theater, dance, the visual arts, even the, the quote unquote low tech arts of drawing and charcoal from a live figure. There's so much technique, so much detail that there is now the technology to share, to record in a shared music, in a shared media studio for synchronous or asynchronous sharing. For instance, um, PSU oboe players spend an awful lot of time in rehearsal. I think in music we really have the, the seat time versus the doing homework elsewhere really kind of mastered. They go off and practice, they show up for rehearsal where their presence is absolutely required. But this is very complicated. Making the reeds, the reeds are crowing, they are made out of a piece of cane, a rondo donax cane. It's 10.5 uh, millimeters in diameter, it is gouged to a thickness of 0.6 millimeters in the center, 0.45 at the side. I think I'll stop there. <laughs> it's very detailed, it's very complicated, very essential. So what we have here is an idea where we could be doing almost the opposite of a MOOC. This is very specialized, advanced material critical to a discipline that could be more easily shared thanks to very recent advances in high fidelity recording, both visual and audio. Um, noticing on my um, slide here, um, the required courses in music, um, our prereqs rival um, uh, the pre-engineering prereqs. <laughs> How do I know? I have a pre-engineering student in my oboe studio as a music minor. He's the busiest guy on campus. <laughs> but if you don't have to be seated in my studio, gathered around my desk, peering at my 73 millimeter long read while I make tiny adjustments. If you can actually access from a remote location in enough detail that information, think of the time that saves. My engineering minor music, excuse me, music minor engineering major can go and work on the seven page calculus project. I've never seen a seven page calculus project before. I was actually rather impressed. <laughs> Um, but the other thing that I think would be even more exciting about a shared or a collaborative media studio is that perhaps our students of the future are going to be getting double degrees. Maybe that chemistry student who likes to play the bassoon is going to finally come up with a material to, su to substitute for the Arundo Donax I have to work so hard to process. Maybe that electrical engineer is going to come up with a better way to amplify the oboe that's less troublesome in live performance. There's so many collaborative solutions if we can make this specialized information in many disciplines more easily accessible. Um, thanks again. I'm Charlotte Mathway from the School of Business, and I'm here to present the Launch in Nine proposal. This is a cross-disciplinary proposal that involves a nine-month entrepreneurial experience that was really inspired out of frustration that those of us who work in this area have with helping our students navigate a pathway from our curriculum, which is substantial in this area, and our extracurricular activities out into the larger um, entrepreneurial ecosystem of Oregon. For those of you who are not familiar with Oregon's startup community, this is one of the largest and most vibrant startup communities in the country. We ranked sixth in the U.S. last year in terms of the number of business formation, per capita business formation out there. So these are very engaged 
individuals who have expressed an interest in working with us. The goal of this program is to literally help student-led uh, entrepreneurs launch from idea out to commercial venture in the, in the span of a nine-month period. Last fall, I had a speaker in one of my classes. His name was Ken Levy. He's a founder and CEO of a local startup called Fortel. And he talked about the challenges of attempting to launch a venture, and I think can explain them better than I can. Um, I live in the gorge, so I'm around a lot of extreme athletes, and a lot of them are entrepreneurs. It's the very same thing. You, you know, the job as an entrepreneur is not to go out and take risks. The job is to find the least risky path through a very risky situation. It's the same thing when you're doing extreme sports. You're, you're out, not out there trying to add risk. You're trying to take risks that you find exhilarating, but figure out how to come to the end safely. So the goal of this proposal is to help our students go through this extremely risky process uh, and come out at the other end with a viable venture. The program is div divided broadly into two cr groups. The first component is a pre-launch series of activities that we're housing under a badging challenge that we have um, thought about, which will allow students to essentially earn the prerequisites that we think they need in order to successfully enter the program in the fall. This will include taking courses that are relevant to the topic of launching businesses, as well as engaging in some of the extracurricular events, including Portland State Startup Weekend, in order to earn the necessary points to qualify for entry into the program. The other objective of our badging challenge is really to create a socializing event to allow students from different schools to get together to understand each other's strengths and learn how to leverage those into successful collaborations and to have some fun while they're at it. The launch phase is broken into three components, which will begin in the fall, in theory, where we would have uh, teams come together and literally begin to establish businesses. We would work with them with a group of mentors, not only from campus, but also from the community, who would uh, help those students identify opportunities, come up with business models that make sense, and develop an initial concept. The fall portion of the program really culminates in a pitch session where the the venture teams will begin describing what they're proposing and will be competing for resources and seed money to bring their academic idea to reality. The second phase of the program is a prototyping phase, and the idea at this stage is to tie in with existing capstone requirements that are in place in the engineering, computer science, and business school. We're proposing piloting this venture with those three schools. And the goal at this stage will be to have students prototype their service or product solutions. In the business school, the, the, that component of the team would be looking at the viability of the business model, projecting the finan financials of the model, and beginning to establish a, a literal presence in the marketplace. During this process, we will be encouraging these students to change direction as their research suggests they need to. The spring term really revolves around going live. In order to um, successfully complete this program, students need to be able to launch technically as well as uh, from a commercial standpoint into the market, and they need to be begin to try to generate revenue. The event uh, concludes with a public pitch session which is designed to secure ongoing funding for these student-led ventures. In terms of the program, highlights we're looking, first of all, to utilize a unique innovation emphasis. What I've just described to you is a lean startup approach to bringing minimal viable products or services into the market. We're going to emphasize market disruption um, as a very successful way for entry for small business. This is a cross-disciplinary effort in that we're attempting to leverage um, students from both the engineering, computer science, and business schools. In this pilot venture, the goal would be to develop a process that we could roll out to the full campus by fall 2014. We're also using the flipped classroom notion that has been described here today. Uh, the unique, one of the unique components of this is that we would be looking to develop original content for this program, which really would feature Oregon's entrepreneurial ecosystem. From student, in terms of student outcomes, we're looking to help them build credentials that will enhance their employability and, of course, offer them the opportunity to attempt to create their own jobs. There will also be significant networking opportunities as they work with mentoring teams that are populated not only by faculty but by interested uh, individuals from the community. And at the university level, we feel like this provides a defense to some of the online disruption that, again, has been described today. 
We, we believe that this will help strengthen our commitment to the community and uh, achieve a larger objective of the university to um, reinforce the economic vitality of the region. We are part of a team, again, that is comprised of faculty from School of Business, James McNames and Antonia Jetter are also on, on the project with me, and we've begun to attract additional collaborators. If any of you are interested, we'd love to invite you in, and we appreciate your time. Thank you. I'm here just to say good afternoon to everybody. When we are done with our video, I say thank you. I represent the team. And we, have, we are one second shy of five minutes, so we don't need a reminder, and I'll start now. Hello, I'm Jack Strayton in Physics and University Studies, and I'm leading an interdisciplinary team spanning four departments that's trying to bring uh, some nanotechnology junior level courses online. I'll be focusing on the specialized filming of the process. Before I slip behind the second camera to join my freshman inquiry student, Taylor Bradbury, I'd like to introduce James Morris, who's in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. We'll give you an overview of the project. Good afternoon. My name is Jim Morris. Recently, I led an interdisciplinary team on a successful NSF proposal to develop three innovative lecture courses and a lab in nanotechnology. Shortly you will also hear from the co-PIs Peter Merck from Physics and Lisa Weasel from Biology. These courses will bring together science and engineering students and others from non-technical majors to study nanotechnology from different perspectives in the same classroom. Hi, I'm Peter. I'm an associate professor in physics and I'm also a crystallographer. I've been developing a course on the introduction to nanomaterial science and engineering at the 400 and 500 level. So that has been running for a couple of years. But what we really need at Portland State is to start earlier at the 300 level. So with the help of the NSF uh, funding, I'm going to develop such a course over the summer and it's just a very great opportunity with the Provost Challenge to develop an online version of it as well. With that, it is over to Lisa. Hi, I'm Lisa Weasel. I'm a molecular biologist and I'm a faculty member here at PSU in the Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies Department. My interdisciplinary course, Nanotechnology, Society and Sustainability, is going to introduce students from a diverse range of majors to um, social justice applications and environmental issues pertaining to nanotechnology. It's also going to give them the tools to grapple with the important ethical dilemmas that are raised by new technologies. Putting this course online is going to be able to broaden the range of views we can consider in the class, and it will also allow marginalized voices who might not otherwise speak up in class to enter into the dialogue and the debate. I really believe this interdisciplinary certification in nanotechnology is going to help students from a broad range of both STEM and non-STEM majors prepare for careers and contributions to society, drawing on science and technology and nanotechnology in particular. The third course is undoubtedly the most challenging pedagogically. A focus on nanotechnology modeling and simulation must both challenge the STEM students and be sufficiently accessible to the non-STEM students to achieve the secondary goal of an appreciation of how modeling and simulation are used by scientists and engineers in the development of new technologies. It was this mixing of STEM and non-STEM students that appealed most to NSF. To promote relevance, 
there will be an emphasis on modeling sensor applications in environmental and biomedical monitoring and similar areas. And now we will pass you over to Professor Eric Sanchez of Physics in the laboratory to uh, demonstrate what we hope to achieve in the lab videos. That's your magnification 300 times. That's your working distance. That working distance is calculated by how much current you put in some of these coils. So essentially what you have is condenser lenses up here that change your brightness aspect going down to uh, an objective lens at the bottom which is focusing like a knife, like an optical microscope. Now what you do is you need to adjust the focus to get a focused image. So go to 10,000 times magnification and get a very, very clear image, okay? And we're going to see what happens. 10,000 times. That's correct. Yep. You're barely there. Now even looking at that, wouldn't you say there might be a problem? It's not focused, right? Go ahead and zoom in to something in the center of the screen that you can get a good image of. You got 10,000. Now get a good image. You want to, uh, yes, yes. You're probably on two course. Yeah. Yes. Very nice. All right. Thank you. So my name is Ralf Wiedenhorn. Uh, I will present uh, our proposal, that's proposal number 40, uh, on physics for pre-health and life science majors in collaboration with community experts. So as we discussed today, higher education is going to change. Students are already using new technologies and this will only increase. At PSU, we will implement these technologies, but I don't think it's a good idea if you just throw every course that we have up on the web. Only if the courses that we develop here are actually able to compete on a national, international level, it makes sense for using our own content. Otherwise, you know, using content developed elsewhere and then you know, using maybe a flipped classroom and provide services at PSU makes probably more sense. Now, I do not believe that, well, you know, the Ivy Leagues are always superior to what we have here. At times, well, very often that may be the case, but this is not a general thing. And I do believe that we can develop educational content that is competitive on a national and international level. So, Absolutely, we can develop this. The project that I would like to talk about here is a project that we have worked on for the past four or five years. And we have developed a lot of educational content and have brought together a great team of individuals. Uh, in this team, we have about 30 biomedical researchers and physicians, uh, a lot of them from OHSU, but also from other places. Uh, we have educational researchers. Um, some are here, but we have some at other universities uh, in the US as well as abroad. That's an important component. You've got to assess if the material that you develop is effective. So doing you know, serious assessment of our material will be a key component. 
we had a lot of students being involved already in the development of this material. I say here 15. I think it actually is probably much more. Um, so students can really contribute to this, and that helps us. We can develop better content this way. At the same time, it also provides a great experience for our students. Now, what we will develop will have an impact on a large number of PSU students. So let me briefly talk about uh, the educational content that we have developed. So here on the, this is an example of an online lab that we are working on with a group in Germany. Um, so they actually use real lab equipment, but they can push it around you know, on a web browser. That's another a lab uh, activity that we have developed. And we are really a national leader on physics education to pre-health and bio majors. So we are currently in the middle of an NSF2 grant that's transforming undergraduate education in the sciences. That's a $200,000 grant. It's a three-phase project. So the next phase, the second phase, would be uh, over $400,000. We have pre received funding through industry. Um, we have published uh, significantly on this topic, and we have received multiple awards. I just come back from a physics t uh, teacher conference, and we are really leading in this effort. Thank you. So to give you a few examples of stuff or material that we have developed, this is a video of, uh, that we took at the uh, Balance uh, Disorder Laboratory at OHSU and gives a great connection to uh, pre-health majors and bio majors to mechanics, which you know, is really, really hard for, for students to understand. Why do they need to learn all this physics uh, if they want to be a, a doctor? Here is a video of Dr. It's Dorn very hard that explains to see very well what the issue is. Some of the principles that you are taught in class. And then certainly I remember when I was an undergraduate sitting in physics classes for a whole year, uh, looking at you know, um, classical mechanics and optics and you know, modern physics and so on and so forth. And I mean, by rote, I would memorize them because that's what I needed to do, but I didn't think past it very much at all. Turns out uh, what I do now is the perfect application of what I learned back then. So the video here on the bottom was also from a community expert that was a physician that does LASIK surgery. And great connections between optics, the physics, and the medical application. So this is what I want to get across. I want that our students understand that connection. I want to connect them with the community. To, to summarize, what are our goals? We want to develop online content in collaboration with our community experts. So we want to tap into this. Our students greatly profit from this. You know, if you want to go into medical school, it's great if you get in contact with local physicians, with, uh, with researchers. Um, we have a number of collaborators at OHSU. Um, they want to implement material that we develop here also at the graduate program in medical physics. They are actually developing content there as well in collaboration with us. This content can be used also by medical professionals. And we really believe that you know, this can be a successful model here at PSU. But we believe we can also extend this further and share this with other uni universities. So, this content, you know, in, uh, uh, in the second step, we really aim to not leave this here with this, within this community, but extend it. And we have great collaborations in the physics community as well as in the biomedical community. Thank you. Quite a difference in height here to have to move the microphone down. Um, so we're going to give you a 10-minute break. Um, I fingers crossed that technology will still be okay when we get back, but a 10-minute break, and then we'll resume with a, 
uh, remainder of the presentations.
everyone to, um, if I could ask everyone to please um, take a seat. And uh, make sure you've got coffee <laughs> or whatever else you need. Um, and then we're we're going to do this next um, this next set of presentations, and then we'll take a um, we'll take a short break, and then do the culminating sessions that we have planned. So. Good afternoon. I'm Sarah Bradley, and uh, Ann Curry Stevens and I are proposing the development of an online Master's of, of Social Work degree with a specialization in community and leadership practice. Whoops. And that's not supposed to be there either. The video is not supposed to be there. There. Okay. Thanks. What's our idea? We would like to increase the access to the MSW degree by converting our current curriculum to an online format with weekend practice labs two times a term. What are some of the current barriers to students getting an MSW degree? Currently we have at least 10 hours a week that are required for students to be actually in class on top of that, they need 16 hours a week of internship. The rising tuition and the graduating salaries increasingly become barriers. The cost of travel to campus, the limited capacity in our graduate classes um, to offer uh, classes, as well as the limited capacity for field placements, which is what we call internships in the Portland metro area. The lack of administrative and community electives for our distance students. We have distance sites around the, uh, the state that do not have any of these electives available to them. And the fact that currently all of our courses online, uh, on campus as well as distance are offered during a week. So now I want to give you the student's perspective on this. Many of us are struggling financially um, in really profound ways. Many of us are overtaxed. Um, I have friends who are single parents with full-time jobs who are also trying to get an MSW. And it's really hard to figure out how to get onto campus to do what we need to do to go to class and to live lives and to be balanced. Currently, I'm driving up from Hood River, which makes it a tough commute. And it's especially tough economically with the gas that I have to spend. Um, but that, I'd say, is probably the biggest barrier. Currently, my family and my significant other are in Washington State, so I'm commuting most every weekend, or, um, and that's very taxing, um, just on you know, not only my ability to finish the work and to access everything easily, um, but to just be able to be present and <laughs> cognizant for all my courses because... The biggest challenge for me um, is being able to work um, because of the scheduling of the classes and the scheduling of um, my specific internship right now. Um, I, can, I can't even work a part-time job that's regular, so I can only work on call. Um, another challenge is getting here because I don't have a car, um, so I usually take about an hour to get to and from places. I have a, a pretty major health diagnosis, which means I struggle with fatigue. And I find that at times having to come in every week um, for long periods of time because the classes fall on the same days, on days that I sometimes have other obligations, I am too tired to work, I'm too tired to learn, I'm too um, fatigued to get what I need. You have to work to subsidize uh, you know, being able to live while you're in school because you have financial aid to cover like books and tuition and things, but then um, to balance a work and the needing to work because of the um, the limited amount of money I get from the from funding, so I feel squashed. So needing to work 
and everything everything combined, I feel like I, I don't soak up the material as much as I would I like. I was actually in a online program um, previous to transferring to PSU. Um, I transferred mainly because of cost. One of the reasons why I dropped from the two-year program was because I had to remain working. Financially, I couldn't just, I couldn't do it um, with the bills and everything, and I had to make a big choice, and I know it's going to cost more in the end, but right now I need that steady income to come. To come. We did a student survey and we had 125 student responses and the most frequent and most common response around the program was that students need more flexibility. What she said was more flexibility. Oh, why does it keep coming up? Don't count this against my time. There. <laughs> So a little bit more data. Um, we've got a little bit of data on the retention of students of color in 2007, 2008, 2009. And as you can see, when the fiscal um, impact started hitting the country, we had actually only 45% of our students in 2009 who completed the master's degree in two years. Many of them had to move to part-time. And as you had heard that student say, moving to part-time is more expensive. What will we do? We're going to convert the existing curriculum to an online format, some of it asynchronous, some of it synchronous. We're going to develop practice labs to allow for the practice and evaluation of skills, offer those on the weekends, two times a term. We're, this will, we think will be appealing to students of color, students in rural communities. We're the only masters of social work in the state at this point. It's appealing to low-income, older students, single parents, rural, out-of-state students, and students who are currently paying $42,000 a year to attend the USC online MSW program. Our current partners are many faculty in the School of Social Work in the different program areas. The School of Fine Arts is going to, their performance classes are going to have students develop role plays for our skills labs, the librarian, Center for Online Instruction, and we're also reaching out to other people in OIT to be able to help with the flipped classroom. So thank you. Hi, I'm Joyce O'Halloran, and I'm representing a, a course design group that's been working together in the uh, Department of Mathematics and Statistics for um, a year now. And um, I'd love to hear in the keynote uh, address the phrase creating learning environments because that's what we've been working together to do. And also with the idea of um, working together than, rather than each individual reinventing the course. And so we've, we've had that um, lovely experience of creating learning environments, trying them out, and then um, changing the things that don't work and improve, improving the things that do work. Um, so my title here is Meeting and Exceeding Student Goals in Mathematics and Statistics. So that student goals kind of jumps out at you. What are student goals? It might not be what they want, but it's what they need, right? Student goals <laughs> originate in the requirements that are set by their programs. And often in the department, we refer to these courses as service courses. But you know, they're service courses to thousands of students. And um, since those do are driven by requirements of programs from other departments, we've uh, been working for years to communicate with other departments, well, successfully communicating with other departments on what their expectations are for what their students, what they want students to know out of their mathematics courses. So we've 
um, had an ongoing dialogue with chemistry, biology, economics, business, engineering, lots of other places. And then also keeping in mind the graduation requirements for non-STEM students. Um, because they just have to take four credits of math of some kind at the 100 level or above. But what best serves them is some kind of quantitative literacy. So um, that's uh, what we've been working on there. But a lot of those students put off that requirement for, a, you know, till the end of their uh, college experience. And sometimes that means that they don't wind up graduating or they take more time to graduate. Um, so um, our program so far that what we have in place so far in transforming the uh, service course offerings are one year ago we uh, put in place mandatory placement um, but the placement uh, exam includes a learning module. Um, so uh, that's something we want to build more on. And then also what we've done in the last year is we've piloted uh, some flipped courses. And you've probably heard flipped over and over again today. So I don't need to say much about it. Uh, but the idea is that lectures aren't in class, they're on video. Uh, and classroom time is spent on doing activities to develop ideas um, or work on um, harder, harder uh, concepts. Um, and also along with the uh, videos, we have computer assisted homework and e-tutoring. So remember those horrible nights of getting stuck on that problem and you're working at it for an hour and you can't figure it out? Well, now students could just go to the computer program, go to that problem and, and click on uh, let me see an example or help me solve this and they, or a video and they can uh, get some understanding of how to work th through that problem without just sitting there getting more and more frustrated. So, you know, the technology has made a huge difference in what we can accomplish and uh, how students can be successful without quite so much, um, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. Um, so uh, our, the student, our student here comes to PSU, wants to enroll in math, they take the placement test, and if they place into the class they want, they just enroll in it, and if they don't, they use the learning module to improve their skills and then retake the placement test up to three times um, to get into their class. But, and the placement places them into calculus, statistics, pre-calculus, and 100 level uh, liberal arts courses. Our plan with these liberal arts courses is to um, offer a variety of things like variable credit modules, one or two credit modules, and also more quanti qu quantitative literacy um, in more modern um, things like game theory uh, to do optimization and, and things that they that weren't typically available before. Um, so if a student doesn't place into uh, any of those courses, what, even after they've worked on the learning module, what do they do? Well, that's our vision for that is that they continue using the Alex learning module but in an emporium format, which you've also heard about, probably heard about today. Um, you know, large room full of computers. Uh, they uh, are required to be in the computer lab for so many hours a week and there are people circulating in the lab to help them out. Um, but what they're working on is computer tutorials that they can work on in the lab or outside. Um, and I think you've heard about what com Emporium is. So what we're planning here is student success that's informed by um, the content informed by input from other programs. Um, we'll have common competency-based assessment uh, through the Alex placement. And we'll do this with technology-based placement, technology-based instruction, and alternative class formats. Thanks.
everyone. Um, I am here to propose a new master's program uh, from the math department. Uh, and here, here is the title of the uh, proposal, an innovative master's, master's science program in industrial mathematics. Got it, okay. I have a little voice, but I hope I have a big idea. <laughs> okay, and uh, here's our expanding list of uh, collaborators. So a professional master's is, is not a new idea. It's, uh, it, the idea is to create a workforce which combine mathematical training, advanced mathematical training, as well as uh, business and workplace skills that are valued by employers. Um, and the, the plan is to collaboratively train students, so not just in the math department, but uh, have components in business, engineering, and sciences. And this, is, uh, this idea has received a lot of attention in the last decade or so from uh, various funding organizations, beginning with the Sloan Foundation, and afterward uh, NSF has been supporting many of these, and even the, the stimulus package had funds specifically earmarked for programs like this. Okay, so if you begin to think that this is just another professional <coughs> master's program, then, uh, well, uh, here is something shocking. We are going to replace credit hours. Meaning that we're going to, we want a grant degree to anyone establishing mastery in five, you know, in these five areas. Okay, so uh, mastery of uh, five theorems. That's not a surprise. We are mathematicians. We we love our theorems, so that shouldn't shouldn't be a surprise. Mastery of algorithms. We want our we we want our students to be technologically savvy, uh, and we also want them to know mathematical models in other disciplines, like in engineering or, or sciences. We also want them to know the state-of-the-art statistical and mathematical software packages so that they have facility to work with them so that when they go to a company, for example, and when they, have a, when they get a job and go to a company, then uh, they would feel comfortable moving from one software package to another that's used in various companies. And they also need uh, to establish mastery in uh, some basic business tools, business communication, marketing, and finance. Okay, now, uh, how are we going to establish this mastery? Uh, okay, so the how part, I'll come to it in, in a second. But let me uh, finish the, the other innovative aspects of this program. Uh, by virtue of this, this, this idea of establishing mastery, we were able to allow students who are returning from industry into the academic environment uh, to reduce credit hours and, and reduce cost to degree. Because if they have, if they know, for example, a, a set of software tools that they, they are conversing with due to their work experience, then they don't, they, they can already establish mastery in one or two items. And they only need to take coursework for the remainder. And we will use technology for, not only for delivery of the course content, but also, uh, uh, also in training the students in scientific computation or in high performance computation. So we'll use the academic re uh, research uh, computing infrastructure and bring that into our master's program. And students can customize time to graduation. Uh, a full-time assiduous student can finish in one year, whereas a part-time student, we would allow a part-time student to go on up to three years. And they can also select their own focus areas depending on what they, what, what they like. And of course, there are many details to be worked out in the how part, uh, and one of it, involves creation of a faculty panel. The idea is a student select, a student would select examiners from their panel and these, each, each faculty member in the panel have the right to declare mastery in one or more areas. So a student would have to do oral exams or, 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 other, or other means of evaluation in conjunction with one or more members of the faculty panel. So this is a faculty intensive, a faculty intensive, uh, uh, endeavor, so uh, I hope that we are not going to be obsolete after the keynote uh, speaker <laughs> cautioned us. Uh, and then we will create collaborative work, uh, workshop spaces where the students and the faculty will interact, and mostly students, but uh, one or two faculty will guide them in the, in the discussions. And then there will be, uh, uh, these, these workshop spaces will be technology enabled, as well as the classrooms uh, to enable delivery of, of online content. And then an industrial board will oversee uh, the, the, the curricular development and the program structure and, uh, and we, would, we would ask them for advice on how, uh, how to change the curriculum uh, as, as, as time progresses. And of course, this is all a work in progress, so uh, any ideas are, are very welcome. Thank you.
If all you can see is the top of my head, I really am here. Uh, but it's, it, and it's great to be here, even if all you see is the top of my head. But um, when, uh, I, for me, the, the Rethink initiative has inspired uh, some creative proposals as I've been sitting here all day and listening, and some very exciting partnerships, including this amazing group that we have put together. Uh, when I first heard about the Provost Initiative, I was reminded of another moment of inspiration for me. Um, I was walking through the park across from my home and noticed the sign on the wall of the public loo. And it said, uh, a unique solution to a universal problem. So, surely, if a toilet can reinvent itself, so can a university. <laughs> this particular toilet has its own Facebook page with 100 plus uh, friends. Uh, apparently, uh, those are individuals who like to t talk to a toilet. Uh, and uh, is also active on Twitter. So see, there's precedence for everything. Uh, our universal challenge or opportunity is to inc uh, was brought about, I think, for me uh, by the observation of the numbers of non-traditional students we have, and this is certainly a national trend with about 38 percent of students uh, enrolled in colleges uh, above the age of 25, and here at PSU, an impressive 60 percent of our students are over 25. These students come with uh, both uh, challenges and some wonderful skills and talents. And according to the literature, their number one consideration in selecting a college is the availability of credit for life experience. Hence, we start on our purpose. Uh, so this inspired a number of different questions when we finally got out of the loo. Um, and uh, most of those uh, centered around how do we accurately assess what students know and how can we recognize in some way the diverse learning experiences that our students bring to us. So um, our purpose is to build on what has already been started here, uh, to design a flexible, team-led, academically and fiscally sound, individualized approach uh, to both concurrent learning assessment, learning while students are enrolled at PSU, as well as prior learning assessment. Um, the definitions of prior learning assessment um, stress the validity of this approach, though the fact that it is also underutilized, and the variety of ways in which students can learn outside of the classroom. Our unique solution includes assembling an interdisciplinary, interinstitutional team of faculty, staff, students, and community members, revisiting and analyzing PSU's existing mechanisms for uh, credit for prior learning, using existing course learning outcomes or helping to develop outcomes in required courses to guide prior and ongoing assessment, and selecting and piloting one or more of um, a number of different approaches that have already been used and some that are still waiting to be field tested, including the digital personal narrative which was one of my favorites. Uh, we also plan to train and use student advisors and coaches, so students will participate actively in this process, to develop guidelines uh, for credit for prior learning, uh, and to engage with and market uh, our approach to potential employers, community college administrators, and many others. What's unique about what we're doing? Uh, the focus on both prior and ongoing learning acquired outside of the traditional classroom. We will have both an on-ground and online option for demonstrating learning. Ooh, the whole thing was on the toilet. Uh, coordinated interdisciplinary interinstitutional team, individualized assessment to reach a, a broad and diverse group of individuals, and using multiple assessments, not just one assessment, to assess learning. The impact will be significant and profound, including decreasing the number of terms students take to complete a degree, lowering debt, uh, strengthening the clarity of the institutional uh, learning through learning outcomes, and improving uh, placement of our students. Uh, 
Also on impact, uh, I borrow from the literature, prior learning is the next disruption. Prior learning's impact on higher education could be enormous. Its potential could even rival that of online learning. So, uh, are we ready? Uh, and um, we don't have to stand in line for this one, but it's, we are overflowing with possibilities. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my name is Andrew Black. I'm a professor in computer science, and I'm too short to stand behind the podium. Um, but I came prepared with um, old-fashioned technology. No videos here. Um, so I'm going to talk about an apprenticeship-based degree in software development. Um, why software development? Uh, um, well, because we're computer scientists, and that's what most of our graduates end up doing. So we've heard a lot about our role as instructors and teachers. What do we actually do as instructors? And I've listed five things on the screen here. Number one is what I uh, discovered when I came to the United States, you, you people quaintly call book learning. Um, but we also do other things. We offer learning experiences. We actually interact with our students. We give them projects. We work with them. We motivate them to actually want to learn. And of course, we assess their progress towards a credential, and we design study programs for them to help them get figure out what skills they need. Uh, what do MOOCs do well? Well, they do that well if it's a good MOOC. And to some extent, they do a little bit of assessment. But my experience of online assessments has been they're fairly lightweight. So uh, we want to leverage that by talking about a rather old, not a new, but an old educational mechanism called the apprenticeship, which is a learning model that emphasizes, as it happens, the things that MOOCs don't do. Learning through experience, motivating a student, obtaining a recognized credential and individualized uh, curricula. Um, incidentally, they also make education affordable, which is another issue. And the reason they do that is because apprentices produce value for paying customers, and those customers put money into the system, which are then used to pay the, the, the apprentices. So what we're proposing is an apprenticeship-based degree program where a single studio replaces something like the 20 courses that we currently require for a degree. And graduation requires demonstrated competency, not course completion. So again, like the last two or three talks, we're talking about getting rid of credit hours as a mechanism uh, for graduation. The book learning, well, that comes from online courses, or from books, heaven forbid, or from research papers, or from the web, or from interacting with other students, or whatever mechanism you need. But there's also tacit learning going on that supplements that explicit learning because you're actually working on a project with other people with more experience, and that is a powerful learning experience. Motivation comes from having a job you have to do, which is producing some working software, and not knowing how to do it. So you go out and find out. You ask questions. You want to learn. So the apprentices are developing real software for real customers, and apprentices at different levels work together. And also, they work with professional developers because that's how one learns. Uh, why do we think this can work? Well, the short answer is because it has worked. A program like this was launched in the 2004-2005 academic year in New Mexico. Um, I've been talked to a couple of the professors who were involved in doing that. Um, it isn't running right now, uh, but it's looking to start up again, and we could be its new home. Um, no time to talk about exactly the backstory there. But I do have a couple of pictures. This is a studio uh, at, in New Mexico, uh, a few students working on a project. Uh, we, they do have instructors, that's actually Dave West, uh, presenting a student with sort of a credential of graduating to a, moving up to a certain level in the program, which is a t-shirt. Um, on the back, on the whiteboard there is the product backlog for a particular development methodology um, and so forth. So why are we talking about software development? Well, because I'll be stupid to stand up here and tell the geologists how they should be teaching uh, their subject. I mean, we, we know something about this. More interestingly, existing educational programs are not very effective. Um, there is an enormous gap between the most effective software developers and the least effective. And it turns out the employers will pay not just for software that works, but also for um, team-ready graduates. 
Um, the best employers at this point take graduates with a bachelor's degree and put them into a six-month boot camp where they actually learn how to develop real software for real customers as part of a team. Uh, because that's not something, we do a little bit of that in our program, but we don't do all that much of it. Um, we're replacing uh, courses by hundreds of competencies that are fairly fine grain. Each one can be mastered at several different levels. The highest level here are what you'd expect of a doctoral student note. Typical undergraduates may be at level three or four. We're aiming for uh, 10 times more effective than the average developer. Um, and there's a SWOT analysis. And obviously, we can't go through all these points, but there are dangers and there are opportunities, and we can grasp them if we try. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. It's really a pleasure to have the opportunity to present a proposal that has been actually a long time in coming. Um, in brief, what we're trying to present uh, could be uh, considered a pilot for other programs around the university. We want to offer something that is higher quality, builds greater reputation, is shorter, is lower cost, and serves more students. There's a lot of wins in there, I think. Uh, but how do we do this? First of all, just so you know, we've already rethought the name. So we continue to rethink. The proposal's name was Global Edge. Uh, we've renamed it the Global Impact MBA. Uh, what this MBA essentially does is build on existing strengths that we have. As some of you may know, we've been rated as the number one sustainability MBA in the world for small programs. That is a program that serves under 100 students. We also have a social innovation incubator. The social innovation incubator serves our students and our community to develop early stage businesses that solve social problems. We also recently became an Ashoka, Ashoka Changemaker Campus. Really, this is an opportunity to inspire interdisciplinary work that focuses, again, on key social issues. And we in the MBA program offer two social enterprise study abroad programs, one in India and one in Nicaragua. Our students just returned from the program in India, serving villages, uh, villagers to solve key social issues that they, they face through innovative business models. So those are the strengths that we build on. But unfortunately, I believe we face some serious constraints in achieving all of those major wins. What are those constraints? The first one is that we live in a world of single discipline-based design. That is, we have instructors, brilliant as they may be, and as discussed earlier, go in and teach their course, and then the students will go into the next course, delivered by the next faculty member on that next discipline, and so on and so forth. This is very limiting in terms of creating a truly integrated design, innovating the leading edge in programs. Second, we have a credit hour, credit hour based curriculum. I have led many revisions to curriculum. I have created many new degrees. And I can tell you, this is perhaps, in my opinion, the most deeply limiting factor that we have as an institution. And third, although we are certainly building some asynchronous and synchronous capacity here, in my opinion, it still remains very limited. And it must be built out very substantially to do some of the work that all of you talked about in terms of flipped classrooms, in terms of scale up, all of those ideas that have been presented today, we still are pretty limited in our capacity to deliver on those activities. So in my view, in moving forward with something like the Global Impact MBA and other programs that might be interested in a similar model, we still have some serious constraints on doing that. But there is change ahead. We've heard it throughout today. There's a lot of reports out there that suggest uh, change is imminent. So what do we want to do? First of all, don't design a program based on disciplines, based on competencies. There's been a lot of you speaking about competencies. 
I'm involved a lot in assurance of learning, learning objectives, but you know what? It's retrofit. It's trying to embed in an existing curriculum. That's not the ideal way to do competency-based learning. The best way to do it is to design from the competencies first. So this program will be designed ground up from a set of competencies. Second of all, modular design, not course design, not student credit hour design, modular design that allows faculty to collaborate and create integrated curricular experiences for our students. Wow. Synchronous and asynchronous delivery, no crowded hours, and no electives. No credit hours and no electives. Focuses on social innovation, global engagement, and integrated interdisciplinary experience. We have five competencies already identified that really allow students to become social entrepreneurs, whether that's working in business, business all the way down to devising their own enterprise. Five modules. Social innovation, operation, marketing, accounting, and finance, global engagement, and social entrepreneurship. These five represent a degree. These three represent a certificate that can be taken for non-credit. Again, looking at the flexibility and scalability of a, of a program. Lots of benefits. <laughs> Mission-driven, competency-based, modular design, sync, async, in-person, lower costs, more scalable, broader market reach, and more flexible. That's the Global Impact MBA. Thank you for your time. Hello, my name is John Holt. I'm an assistant professor of Japanese, a member of the World Languages and Literatures Department. I'm here to talk about uh, our proposal. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, the provost for issuing the challenge and also for allowing us to speak. Uh, I, I'm just one member of a team uh, today at the Winter Symposium. Uh, thank you. Uh, we propose a uh, project that uh, not only rethinks but wants to reimagine how language learning is taught at PSU. Um, <clears throat> the main idea is that, uh, you know, we, uh, we typically, for our first year, second year classes, and some third year classes, typically we meet with students every day, uh, maybe four days a week, five days a week. So we're um, in the trenches a lot. And we were thinking that we, um, the way we learned foreign language and the way that students are learning it now is not necessarily the way they need to learn it uh, in the years ahead. Uh, why be in class uh, for every hour of uh, language? We can do other things uh, online. Uh, so uh, we propose to transfer elements of traditional language classroom instruction to discrete online modules, there's that word again, uh, for different language skills. So that you have different modules for grammar, uh, different modules for writing, uh, reading, listening, uh, or speaking and listening as a distinct unit. These modules be integrated into conventional residential instruction, as well as serving blended and distance format uh, curricular offerings. So then I have a few questions that I wanted to have us think about. Uh, what would be at stake in a radical transformation of language teaching at PSU? Uh, what would the benefits be uh, for rethinking language instruction at PSU? What benefits would there be for students? What benefits would there be for graduate uh, student teaching assistants, uh, for our faculty? Uh, and also for the community. Just a, um, a thought, where we're coming from this idea, like what's at stake, who we are. World Languages and Literatures is the largest department in class. We're the largest department in PSU. We teach over 20 languages. In any one quarter, we teach 3,000 to 4,000 students. We teach students with a wide range of learning styles, experience, skill sets, and learning needs. Uh, and so we are thinking we need a, a new approach on how to best serve them all. What do I mean by different learning styles? Some students come in with zero knowledge of Japanese. 
Some come in with some speaking knowledge because they speak it at home with maybe a mom uh, who's Japanese and dad's American. So they have some language ability. Other heritage students have more intensive uh, language skills and they need certain aspects uh, to kind of complete their mastery uh, or knowledge of, let's say, Russian. Uh, so we're talking about it in a way to, to address a whole range of student needs uh, with a modular approach to language instruction. Uh, you, uh, I'm sure you're aware that students pursuing a BA must take two years of a language uh, as part of the requirements. They can, of course, just uh, take two or three or place out of it. But typically, we see a lot of students. And a, a lot, so a lot of students who, who graduate from PSU uh, come through our gate. We think, then, a project to rethink PSU must include WLL as we reach one of the largest percentages of PSU students. Furthermore, language is the foundation of any culture. WLL is the primary department that fuels and directs the university's internationalization initiative. No internationalization effort can be made without the work done in language instruction from WLL. How we propose to um, carry out this idea? What are we going to do with the challenge? Uh, we want to start off with six languages, six language programs, French, Italian, Modern Greek, Russian, Korean, and Japanese some Western languages, some Asian languages. And we want, what we want to do then is to redesign our courses, uh, rethink how we're doing it, have some time and uh, funding to then to experiment in our classes, uh, and then, um, then to splinter things off for later use uh, on, in purely online modules that could be taken by people who aren't necessarily pursuing a full degree. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But then these could be uh, spun out then to people who want to learn language at PSU. Um, I'm running out of time, but uh, there's uh, various reasons to do this. We also feel that if we start off with a six-program uh, uh, menu, if you will, we can then port this out to the other languages in WLL. It will become a template for the department as a whole. Uh, who can benefit undergraduates? Uh, they need to come in and get their two years of, of uh, language from us. We can fit, find a way to finely tune and, and fit their needs uh, with this uh, program. Community members, people often want to take uh, Japanese from me, and, and they say, I just can't come in and take it. I want to go on a trip, I want to learn, I want to do business. Uh, if we could roll these modules out then for the greater public who may not be pursuing a degree, then uh, we also would kind of open up our base uh, of students. And finally, this would help uh, graduate and faculty because then we would have certain things, uh, online components that we could measure then and, and then uh, write about uh, and pursue pedagogical research. I'm about out of time. I just wanted to um, show that I'm just one member of a large team uh, in this large department. Uh, I thank you for your time. I'm sorry if I went over. Uh, thank you very much. Science and Management Department, and I was a, a collaborator with uh, 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 John Ruder and uh, Dr. Pan. I can do that. Thank you. The Environmental Science and Management Department currently offers two graduate degrees: the Master's of Science, which is a, a traditional MS degree; it's hypothesis-based thesis degree. We also offer the Masters of Environmental Management, which combines cutting edge knowledge in the emerging field of environmental science and the experience of uh, working a real world uh, environmental problem with a community partner. We want to make the Environmental Science and Management degree, or MEM degree, a better degree and do it more efficiently through online uh, class instruction or course instruction and changing our focus in the classroom from teaching to problem solving. As you'll see, we envision 
a curriculum that allows us to maintain the, the high quality of uh, knowledge-based learning and also allows us to have more time to mentor uh, graduate students in environmental science and management in the practice of their profession. The current, sorry, the current MEM degree uh, looks like this. The students take a series of courses that are traditional in the, the traditional classroom, in the traditional classroom setting. There, they are, we have core courses in environmental science and management. Those include physical environmental systems, ecological systems, environmental management, project management. Students take a, a course in quantitative analysis. They take a series of courses in their interest area or co concentration area. They also take a, a supporting uh, elective courses. All of these courses lead our students to the ability to work with a community partner to solve a community, to solve a real world environmental problem or issue. Through the program, the students gain the, ne the necessary knowledge to, so to solve these, pro these uh, problems and the experience of working with a community partner in a professional setting solving those problems. Our proposal is to convert a number of these courses from traditional classroom settings to hybrid online courses. This will allow our students to have an online degree option. This is particularly useful for students, our students that already have jobs in the field and they're taking their master's degree to increases, increase their chances of job mobility or job in the, in the advancement. Just as a note, we already have faculty signed, basically lined up to teach these uh, environmental core courses in a hybrid uh, fashion. We also want to take advantage and full advantage of online courses or MOOC courses to allow our teaching faculty to shift their efforts in the classroom from lecturing to working with students on a one-to-one -one basis. Conversion of traditional classes to online courses using or using existing online courses or MOOC work, uh, cor uh, course material will allow our faculty more time to mentor graduate students through their projects and also allow, also allow, uh, also allow fa faculty to have more students, especially MEM students. We turn, currently we turn away highly qualified students because of, uh, because of faculty uh, capacity. In addition, the faculty would have more time to uh, develop internship internships with community partners. If a student so chose, they could take a series of uh, professional practice courses or plus courses. These courses are currently offered online at OSU or would be, deli or would be delivered and developed online at PSU. If the student takes those PLUS courses, in addition to the existing MEM uh, program, they would get a master's, a, a, they would get a professional science master's degree. Our department has submitted a full proposal to o PSU and OUS to form a professional science master's program in environmental management. The benefits of our proposal are numerous. We have, there are benefits to the students, benefits to the faculty, benefits to the department, benefits to the university. And we want to, we look forward to working with PSU to rethink our program. Thank you.
So I, I just, again, want to make sure that we give a, like a huge round of applause to all the folks that presented today. So. And, and part of the reason for giving them a huge applause is, is that what they were willing to do, um, and this is true for tomorrow and for Friday, what, what they were willing to do is to stand up here and in five minutes try to convey a concept to you. Um, to do it with, um, we threw in a little stress factor um, with the technology. People managed to rise to the, to the occasion. And that these concepts aren't complete yet. As you heard from many of the proposers, they're looking for collaborators. I know a number of you are submitting comments. These are works in progress. And so it's, it's always a little unsettling, I think, at times to present something that you're not done with. So I really do appreciate all the, the work that everybody has done on that. We're going to take a 10-minute break. And then when we can reconvene, um, what we will do is have a, um, I've been calling it the Provost Talk Show, but what, what we will do is have a sort of interview style um, session which really pulls all of the questions that you've been asking throughout the day um, and we'll have a dialogue about those uh, on the stage up here. So I think 10 minutes is five of three, um, so we'll just reconvene back at, at five minutes of three.
Can I get everybody sort of back to your seats if, if you wish, if you may? So we, we are going to do this session right now as a kind of a moderated talk show. And we, we're hoping for big plushy seats for our guests like they have on like The Tonight Show and other shows. But this is the Portland State version. There's no, the president commented that we have no coffee table or anything in front of us. Um, so we're doing this paper Portland cups. State style. And we have paper, paper. cups as, uh, as, as Rob just, just noted. Um, so you've, you, most of you know um, everyone who's on the stage, but I'll just do introductions and then I'll give you a sense of the, the format and the style that we're going to use. So um, we have Dr. Rob Dash, who's our presiding officer of the Faculty Senate and a faculty member in our College of Engineering. You all heard Dr. Mahaffey this morning, uh, and he gave the, the presentation, the keynote, at least I hope you all heard him this morning. Um, and then our president, um, Dr. Rivell, who's um, also spoke this morning. So what I thought we would do is we, throughout the day, have been monitoring your Twitter comments and have taken those and created a set of questions. Uh, we won't be able to ask every question, um, but we combined some of them together. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to serve as the talk show host. I did tell my guests that this is not Jerry Springer. So, but if they do, um, I will be asking each of them questions. And it, um, it is the case that if they do hear something that another one of them says and wants to do a little follow-up, I certainly want to allow them to engage in that. So I don't want the format um, for, for those of you up here on the stage to be very staid and, and, and formal, but I want you to behave. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and they also know that their really. comments should not be 30, 40 minutes each. So I'm going to go ahead and start and ask the first question of our president. Um, and that is, how does or how does not all of this fit PSU's mission of let knowledge serve the city? Well, um, let me uh, start out by saying how wonderful it is. As I said this morning, I thought this was an absolutely major transformational effort on a par with what we did, what the university did in the mid-90s. Uh, I say that without having been there, but just listening to the kind of discussion today, watching uh, a lot of the tweets come in, uh, I just can't think of a better way of uh, really having everybody think about charting this course into unknown territory. Uh, again, you know, we don't really know exactly, we don't know really even approximately where we need to wind up, but we do know that we can follow a lot of experimental pathways to get there. Uh, and, and just the creativity that was on display today is on display today, and the fact that you know, so many people are still here uh, now uh, just speaks to, fortunately, that so many people here see the importance of this, because this is definitely not something where you know a few of us, whether it's in the Senate or in the Executive Committee or, or the deans or whatever, can kind of sit down and figure it out and, and then just make everybody go there. So I really appreciate that. At the same time, I feel very strongly, like I also said this morning, dealing with this issue is very much about figuring out how do we continue to serve our mission? Whether you call that let knowledge serve the city or providing access to excellence, you know, whichever versions uh, of, of words you choose, if we do not figure this out, we will become obsolete. We'll, we'll go bankrupt. We won't be able to sustain ourselves. We'll lose our, uh, our, the, the students. They'll go elsewhere. They'll get served by others. Maybe well, maybe not so well. Who the heck knows? We'll lose our central place that we've been able to build up uh, over the last few decades in this metropolitan area, both as a source of knowledge, education, as well as a central place for civic discourse and cultural activities and, and everything else that we do. So 
To me, uh, being committed to Portland State and what it stands for absolutely makes it essential that we wrestle and wrestle really hard with these questions. We need to think about how do we use all these new technologies and all the new options that exist to continue to have create learning opportunities that are, that are characterized by what PSU has become known for, which is engaged learning, real life learning, learning that uh, is directly derived from the world around us, but that also teaches by having pra people practice that connection with the outside world that isn't just a classroom experience. And it seems to me that uh, all of these technologies provide all kinds of opportunities to do that. So, you know, to me, this is no deviation from any, any mission at all. It is just making sure that we don't stay behind because that would be the biggest betrayal of the mission. So George, here's a question for you. I'm glad I didn't get this one. Um, <laughs> is PSU ahead, behind, or just about right when it comes to action versus talk about these changes in how curriculum is delivered and how students are credentialed? Uh, let me put that across two metrics. Uh, in terms of where you are relative to other institutions. I was thinking this morning as I sat through uh, how grateful I was to be invited to spend the day because I normally go in, do a presentation. Uh, I don't learn much from that. I learned an enormous amount today from staying around and listening and hearing all these ideas. Um, I, I said to Vim a minute ago, I've been on 50 campuses since I started the Red Balloon Project. I've never been through an experience like this in almost three years. So this was remarkable for me. So compared to your peers, you, my, my adoration continues unabated. Um, I think you are, I, I, I love to say to people, oh, you can't do capstones? Really, why, it's too complicated, too many students? Why don't you try Portland State? Let me tell you the story. I, I love to just, and everybody goes, mm, you know, this is. So you're doing great relative to your peers. But, not, but compared to the environment you're in, you still better run to stay in place. So don't get complacent because you're, you're doing really well. I, a couple of editorial comments. One was I was just astounded. I leaned over to Rob at some point and said, this is an amazing, amazing collection of human beings that visited this stage today. Uh, this was stunning of exhibit of talent, and it was just a fraction of the talent that's at this institution. And a few, a few, few comedians, Shelley. Uh, <coughs> stand up. You can do stand up when you get ready to finish here. So, um, so. <laughs> Shelley said she is standing. <laughs> so, the, but the other thing is that I, I, I thought that the, uh, 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 Jeremy offered me the the. This, we all, in higher ed, you always have to have a colon and a subtitle, right? Um, and so the, the, the title is Let Knowledge Serve the City, colon, and Let Our Place Serve Our Mind. Man, that was, that was really cool. I, I really loved that idea, that these pla this place has to be the place that really serves for the kinds of outcomes that, that you guys are talking about. So. Um, I just, I have an enormous sense of um, uh, foreboding, maybe quite a little bit strong. But I mean, uh, this morning I get up, I, I look on my Blackberry. Yes, I still have a Blackberry. Uh, but I look on the Blackberry and, and, and yesterday's MOOC story is replaced by today's MOOC story. The acceleration of this. And then I, I, if you hadn't seen the af afternoon, I, I passed it over to Sana earlier today and said, a little afternoon uplift for you. And at Moody said, uh, higher education is in deep trouble. New report about financial difficulty. Uh, just to, so the, the, the piece that I was excited about today that I heard about was lots and lots of really good ideas. And yet, in terms of truly transformative ideas, I heard lots of ways to improve programs and projects and majors and that. But I'm still, I'm still looking for killer apps 
and I ex and I s expect that I'll see them here. Of course, the one time there was a, there were a couple of killer apps. The one with a language and and use it that was early on. Uh, who was that? Um, um, the, no, Steve's uh, comment about like and the, the notion that we ought to teach intentionally teach language to everybody because of the unique languages of all of our disciplines and stuff. I thought that was that was a stellar sort of cross uh, disciplinary thing. And then late in the the day, uh, who was it? Somebody. Uh, uh, I think it was Scott said, oh, guess what? No more credit hours. And I heard, heard Kevin going, <coughs> you know. <laughs> so, you know, there's a, well, the, I, I think that the hardest thing in all of this, um, I thought, what hath God wrought? Uh, in this case, what hath Portland State wrought? Uh, because this openness is fabulous. The Twitter feed, my man, Right on. It was, I mean, you could see the th audience thinking. It was just really cool. I mean, uh, but what you've got to, re what these guys have to do is create an institution that will allow that to happen and create pathways, not barriers. In the midst of a state system that wants to create barriers and lots of other folks that have legacy systems in place that prevent a lot of this imagination that's going on here from uh, being realized. So, um, a lot great news, lots to come. Thanks. So, Rob, you know you're going to get a question. You know you're going to get a question about faculty work. Um, so, here it is. Okay. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts about how the nature of faculty work might change in the near future? Well, I think the... The, the, the message that I kept getting over and over in a lot of these uh, presentations today about work is that the integration challenge, you know, we've had to integrate a textbook with our notes with potentially a laboratory. And it was, a, it, I think we got back to George's comment about individual actors building those courses. The, the workload that I heard about today was the step towards having to integrate that uh, in a, many more dimensions. And how that integration is going to happen is really where our workload will have to adjust. Because we're, we're not going to be able to, to uh, potentially uh, meet any of the expectations of the 160 projects or the 40 that were presented here today without understanding more about how that integration function is going to work. And we've learned as faculty how to do that in a fairly confined way, as George was talking about at the beginning. But that integration, I think, is really the big challenge that I see coming forward in a short period of time. We, we were talking last night, by the way, at, at, at dinner about uh, some of these larger pieces. And, and one of the things that I said uh, is that we've got, there are a lot of other pieces of this institutional culture that we have to think about. And one of them for me, m one of my current whipping boys is uh, shared governance, uh, most of which is just painfully slow and enor it consumes enormous amounts of time. There are pieces that are really important, but there's a lot of it that's not. And I, I, I cited the last campus I was on, we had more committees than we had faculty. <laughs> and, and I thought, why do people continue to go to faculty, uh, these, comp these committee meetings, and we, palpably to do, I mean, uh, ostensibly to, to do work, and, and yet we just sit around and talk. I, I actually, as provost, finally said, if you're going to list on your RPT stuff that you uh, served on a committee, I wanna, I, I'd like to ask a couple of questions that you have to respond to. Like, did you have any ideas? <laughs> did you contribute anything? Did the committee actually do anything, or did you just get to list that as one of your so-called uh, uh, service commitments? Uh, so I think we've got to think about some other things. I, it's not that faculty don't work hard. There's no question faculty work hard. They're working 110% most of, most of the time. But they're working hard, not smart. And part of it is saying, what could we strip away from the obligations currently there? One of the things I'm intrigued by about the collaborative, the sort of the opposite of Rob's in my Pollyannish moment is that the collaboration means that we all don't have to learn how to load the damn PowerPoint up onto the website. Only one of us has to do that. 
The rest of us can con continue to be techno peasants, which is the way I want to be. Just leave me alone until I, I finally die, and then I won't have to worry about this technology anymore. But so I think that there are ways that the sharing actually reduces workload rather than increases workload. But I do think there's a transition along the way, and there is a possibility that collaborative work, in fact, could take enormously more time rather than 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 really de de thoughtful and appropriate divisions of labor. So, so George, you mentioned shared governance, and in fact, there's a question for Rob um, about that. Um, and that is, um, Rob, what do you think about the role of shared governance, and, and what are some of the kinds of changes that might take place in shared governance, given some of the concepts that have been presented or some of the things that are going on? I think it's important for us to, to uh, from a governance point of view, to think about what uh, those words mean. Uh, governance is often thought of as, uh, as an impediment. Uh, what I see with my colleagues uh, on the Faculty Senate are a lot of folks trying to figure out how to you know, uh, not necessarily act as gatekeepers uh, and a, as a governor in that sense, but uh, really as an additional set of folks to try to figure out the, how to integrate, again back to that word. So rather than governance being one of trying to gatekeep what's going to happen, it's more about figuring out how all the pieces come together. Um, and I think we're learning that better and better each year, uh, how that works. And it boils down to things like uh, faculty in various departments recognizing that they don't have to go to the defense of a particular reserved word, you know, that they have a word that they believe is their word in their department, and that's where that word will be uttered. Uh, governance and f faculty senate gives an opportunity for folks to build the confidence that those words could be shared. And, and that kind of an environment for governance, I think, is, is actually one not of gatekeeping, but again of an enabling and an integration. And that's where I really think we can, we can shine. I'd like to chime in on that because to me, governance, governance is what happens here today. You know, it's where people invent what this place will be like. Governance is not what happens in a committee meeting. Yeah, that's part of it. It's not what happens in the Senate, God knows, most of the time. Uh, but, you know, it's about uh, people collectively figuring out how this place should work, what the nature of work is, what its goals are. Uh, what the specifics are, who is necessary to do it, how that labor is divided up. And, and that's the discussion that is being played with in these 162 ideas, in the ones that ultimately will be funded, that will go forward. That's where the creative wor work of, of really uh, making this place real uh, takes place. And, and that, to me, is what really, of course, we need all the structures. I'm not saying those things don't matter. Of course they do. But you know, if you wait for a committee vote, uh, you know, it's way late in the game. The important stuff is happening here and now. Okay, Vim, this one's for you, and it's really long, and it's an amalgamation of a number of questions. So, what thoughts do you have on how Rethink PSU impacts our efforts on 404020? You knew, everyone knew that was coming, right? Um, especially when it comes to the variability we see now in educational attainment and family background when we consider race, ethnicity, and family income. And there were quite a few tweets about how do we ensure that our most vulnerable students have access to technology. Yeah, well, one lesson, of course, you should never ask a university president or a politician a multi-barreled question <laughs> because they'll just pick on whatever piece they want. Um, but. Uh, I, I think it starts, the first point, and it's sort of what, what I said earlier, uh, to me, this is at the heart of, of 404020. It's at the heart of our mission of providing access to educational opportunities in the Portland metropolitan area. If we do not deal with this, we're not uh, fulfilling that mission. We cannot achieve the goal of having 40% of the population of this state, most of whom live here right in the Portland metropolitan area, and many of whom will look at Portland State to be their education provider, we cannot do it unless we think deep about how we need to change uh, pedagogy and how we go about learning. Uh, the, the question of how much do these various new technologies especially provide opportunity to people of different backgrounds, 
different intellectual abilities, different educational backgrounds, and are there advantages and disadvantages there, is actually not a simple one, right? I mean, at, at its simplest level, you can say, well, people who are too poor to have access to any uh, you know, technological device are, are at a disadvantage. Okay, that's, that's one issue, and it affects some people, not a huge number of people, but it, but it affects some. Um, there's certainly in the research on the effectiveness of online courses, there's evidence to show that there are people who are less verbal, less aggressive, who do a lot better in these non-person, non-in-person uh, learning environments. So there may be a whole group of people that now we don't do a very good job with who aren't adept, who haven't been taught to just feel free to speak up, who might do a lot better in what is essentially a more protected environment of the online learning. You know, the whole notion of the, you know, that this allows for different learning styles for different people. So it gives us a whole bunch of tools instead of offering one pedagogy to this, you know, group of whether it's 20 or 60 or 200 people in your class, you can now, people can move at a different pace, they can emphasize looking at the lectures versus the readings versus the tweets or versus the online discussion. So I think just, this just provides a huge set of, set of tools to actually uh, adapt to the diversity of learners now. You get another question just because you answered that one so well. And so concisely, too. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> this one's short, but the short question, but it might be a long answer. Um, some have expressed concern as to how we as a university will sustain the potential changes. Well, we don't know what the changes are yet, so uh, how we can sustain it. I, I think the, the key will be um, that, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, that in the, in the sort of the venture business, which in a way we're in, we're in the business of, of starting a whole new thing, so that you want to fail, uh, you want to fail fast, uh, right? So we don't want to sustain everything. That would be actually one of the risks, that we start things, and well, we start and we got to keep supporting it. No, we got to fail fast, because we're going to learn from everything we do. And even if we were able to implement all 162 of the ideas that we had here, probably 80 should be dead in six months, and maybe another 40 should be dead a year later. I'm just making up random numbers here, but, you know, and that's probably optimistic, right? Uh, in venture business, you say nine businesses got to fail for every one that succeeds. We have a really hard time accepting that kind of a failure rate in most of our business, right, in most of what we do. We think that once we say, you got to stick to it and stick to it. I've only recently learned that I don't have to finish every book that I start reading. <laughs> uh, I still feel guilty when I stop because I think it's worthless. But so, uh, so maybe that's the first thing that we shouldn't sustaining it is not you know we got to stop we got to figure out and reconfigure. Now, at a certain point, we're on the right path. If you're on the right path, that'll be self-sustaining because people will be coming, people will be learning, people will be supporting it. That's how we know that it is successful. That's how we will sustain it. Again, and this goes back to the comment that George made, we may be doing pretty darn well here, but boy, the world is requiring us to do not just darn well, but really superbly, excellently, move really fast. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we're going to have no choice. We're going to have no choice but to keep changing. We're not going to be able to say, you know what? It's nice, we, su we supported these, you know, 20 of these ideas or 40 of these ideas, and now let's just go back to business as usual. We'll get killed. We'll get killed. Somebody will eat our lunch. Okay. Yeah, I'd add. Um, in the sense that uh, uh, when I listen to these proposals, I heard a lot of what might be characterized as the stretch goal. Where are we going to be at the 100% success of any given one of these programs? And one of the discussions that I think is important for us and, and follows up with what the president was just saying is figuring out the pieces that work. Uh, because uh, we might have a program that didn't necessarily come together the way it was proposed today, but we learned a great deal about how we could take uh, positive steps not only with that program, with many others. And so there's a learning opportunity here of the pieces of the failure that uh, we don't want to just declare something a failure because they didn't hit their stretch goal. There's an 80% goal or there's components of what comes out of these proposals that 
can really provide, I think, a, a, a great opportunity for the next level of keeping up this rapid pace of change that we're talking about. So I would say that the goal of sustaining is, is one of recognizing the pieces that are successful and not necessarily being too quick with the trigger to put a bullet in something just because you think that it didn't get to its stretch goal. Let's, let's, be, let's, let's, let's have the opportunity, especially as scholars and as academics, to consider the pieces that work and synthesize from there. Okay, George, here's one for you. And you might have answered this a little bit, but you know, you, you listened today to, to some of these presentations. You certainly haven't seen them all, but are there big holes? I mean, did you, you know, are there some big ideas that we missed? I don't know that they're big ideas. Uh, I, I'd say there were, there were two, maybe three things that I, I hope we see more of. Uh, one is, and, and part of this was just the format today. Uh, you, you got five minutes, you, you can't talk about all the pieces, and so some of this is, is invisible to me as, as just a, a listener today. Uh, but the commitment to use data as the, uh, and student learning outcomes as the gold standard for whether it works or not has to be at the center of every single one of these proposals, if you ask me. And I didn't, I'm not sure I heard that in every case. This would be fun, this would be cool, this would be, uh, it'd, it'd be cheaper, it would be uh, uh, more, you know, whatever. But the gold standard has to be our students learning and what's the data, what's the evidence to suggest that. Parallel or coupled with that was a concern about assessment strategies. I heard some really interesting ideas about using competency-based models and prior learning models and things like that. But I wouldn't discount the complexity of trying to determine, in some cases, what the learning outcomes are and what you will use as evidence. Um, the good news is that you're not alone in this. Uh, CAIL, the Council on Adult and Experiential Learning, uh, there are a number of people around doing this kind of work and have been thinking about this. So it's, it's again, this crowdsourcing kind of way of thinking about this stuff. Um, I, I saw a tweet up on the, uh, the board a min minute ago that I really agreed with. I waited and finally in the, uh, the session on uh, mathematics, I think it was Joyce, I, I'm not, I can't remember, I believe it was Joyce, uh, or no, it was the, uh, I'm sorry, it was, uh, it was Ann uh, Curry-Stevens, where I saw for the first time a, a visually up on the, the screen, students and student concerns and student stories. I think every faculty assembly ought to have 15 or 20 students telling their story, reminding us over and over and over again how, how complex and difficult those lives are and how we have to continue to be responsive to those concert, uh, circumstances. Um, I, I guess the third piece was uh, that is, is not fair because it, it, it really is, to use Rob's term, a stretch goal, is that I, I wanted some of the proposals to absolutely be boundary destroyers. Uh, and the vast majority of the programs, understandably, were about a particular program that you inhabit, after all, uh, and maybe collabor collaboration with another department. But, but I heard a couple that were really broad scale, like the one about the like program and, and language across the curriculum kind of thing. Uh, but but a, and another one that says we're not going to use credit hours anymore. That's when Kevin was twitching over in the corner there. But, uh, but, but things that really start to, to challenge the, funda the most fundamental uh, propositions and to start thinking really uh, hard. I was saying last night that the uh, aging disease that we all suffer, particularly in a legacy system like we have, is uh, the disease of hardening of the categories. And uh, we've got to really be careful not to, not to have that and uh, constantly be saying why. So I, I had, you know, I, as I told you, I was in Tennessee last week, and uh, University of Central Florida, the guy that's done all the research on online and distance, Chuck Jubin, uh, said students are starting to say, why do we have courses? Why do we have semesters? You've got to ask those questions. 
uh, 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 Bob Ramucci from uh, South Orange County Community College said, why couldn't we have a degree that's just a bunch of badges? Doesn't have anything to do with the number of hours you sat in a, in a chair. I'm sorry, Kevin. Uh, but, but really starting to push the, the, the real boundaries of the, the ways that we constrain ourselves by the, the, the patterns of, uh, and habits of, of the legacy systems that, that we inhabit. And that's, that's hard work. But, it, but I, what I was thrilled by today was the evidence up on the Twitter feed that so many of you were thinking such interesting and cool thoughts and that we, and, and who knew until we saw it up on the, it was the visualization of group thinking. It was really fun to watch. I, I mean, in fact, I was talking to Rob at one point and I couldn't get my eyes off the screen to make contact with him. He thought I was just paying, not paying attention to him. Well, I wasn't actually, but it, it's a, um, anyway. but it was really, it was amazing to watch the Twitter feed, sorry. That's okay, and and just just for the record, I was sitting next to Kevin, and he he did he. he you smiled at that one, though. You smile. I mean, you know, I guess I'm saying that it, credit hours don't drive Kevin's um, sort of behavior. He was he was pretty excited about that. <laughs> I just had to come to your rescue. Right, right. So, so I don't know if you heard that in the back, but what Kevin said, I feel like I do. You do or don't need to defend yourself. He does need to defend himself. It's not about credit hours. It's just that revenue, revenue and credit hours expenditures. Excuse me, revenue and expenditures need to match. Well, okay. One, one of the things so. that I constantly say to my staff, and, and I, we're in a uh, 501c3 in Washington D.C., and I say, never, never forget that. Not-for-profit is an IRS tax category. It cannot be an operating philosophy because you will go out of business if you do not have excess, we call it excess revenue over expense. But if you don't have that, and so don't tell me you're not in a business. You're in a business. It's just a different kind of business and hopefully with a whole lot different motive at the end, not accumulating profit but, but building the democracy that we have. But at the same time, it's a for-profit business. And don't ever say it's not, right, Kevin? So I'm trying to support you okay, here now. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, so this is is either for Vim or Rob or both of you. Um, there were quite a few tweets about research and how to manage the pulls and pressure of the sort of teaching research dichotomy that some people feel at the university. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start out, and uh, Rob, let you please add to it. Uh, I, guess, I guess a couple of thoughts. One is that I think a lot of what we call research gets t takes place in the context of the, of the teaching and learning that goes on, right? Students participate in research. It's a lot of about the partnerships and the engagement uh, we have, uh, you know, depending a little bit on, on, the, on the disciplines, of course. Um, and uh, it'll be fascinating, and I don't know because I haven't looked. At, I have not looked at all 162 proposals. Uh, how many of them explicitly try to think about uh, how does the research part that now takes place, whether it's in the in the physics lab, in the engineering labs, or in uh, in, a, in a field like social work or urban planning, you know, how does that play out when more of the instruction and the whole pedagogical experience uh, is at a distance or is technology mediated. But it seems to me that, you know, it, it just takes on a different form. But, you know, God knows most of our research does not take place necessarily just physically in one place with people. There's all kinds of ways to do it. So part of the challenge of, of how we transform our teaching is no different, it seems to me, to, to also think then, okay, so in that context, how do we uh, change the way we do research when it involves pedagogy and students. In terms of the sort of separate faculty activity, you know, outside of the teaching role, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, obviously, w one model is just to say, well, it, it really doesn't matter. You know, you, if you now spend whatever 60% of your time on teaching, and that may change, that, that other 40% or 20%, depending on how much service you do, you know, that will be engaging in research whatever way you now do it. However, we all know that, of course, the nature of doing research is changing under the pressure 
or at least the technologies, it may not have the same pressures in terms of the tuition model or whatever, but uh, it, it too is changing. So the expertise that we build up by being more adept, uh, by having greater technological capacity, it seems to me is going to be extremely helpful uh, on, the, on the research side as well. But I don't see this uh, change that we're undergoing now as universities. Yes, it's a lot of conversation about the teaching role because that's where the public pressure is around producing the degrees, the cost of education. That's the piece that, 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 that gives us the pressure. But I don't, I don't see us changing our commitment to research out of all this. I really like the sound of that in the sense that we're not changing our, that there's going to be a big change in our focus to research. I think there's a number of research active faculty uh, on any campus, and the, if, we, if the discussion is always about rethink PSU in terms of teaching, there's, an in, there's, an in, there's a potential to get marginalized on the research side, and, and that's not a good thing. Uh, as I was saying last night, we were talking about dinner a couple of times, I said that uh, a real prescription, at least for my colleagues in electrical engineering and whatnot, to go stale would be to not have an active research program. And that would translate directly to how I would be behaving and what I could do inside of the classroom. So these two just, there's, there's, there's obviously a connection here. Do I have the secret sauce about what the right proportions are? I, no. Again, I think it goes back to a comment earlier by the panel here. If we knew those answers, we could become very rich. Uh, and, and, and I don't know that answer. From the point of view of, of a, a sponsored research, you know, one of the questions that comes up to my mind about rethinking PSU and having a forum like this, I thought of this several times today, is if we had a similar sort of pitch that was brought forward by the provost's office in terms of rethinking our, rethinking our research mission, what would be the response, and where, where, where would we be? You know, would we be in the ballroom, which is one of the larger rooms on campus, or would we end up in a classroom? You know, I mean, what would be the response to that? And I would really love the opportunity to find, to, you know, if we could figure out a way to find out how we would respond as a faculty in the same way that we've responded. Everybody's, the positive response we've had to this initiative what would happen if we had a parallel initiative that allowed uh, faculty to consider the research component? And by research, I, I, I mean not just the pedagogy and the things that would come out of this project, but, but sponsored research and things like semiconductors that I work on and things like that. I think it'd be great for us to be able to do that, and I would welcome that as being a, a, a natural next step to one of the things that we've done today. You know, I, I got to add to that. I mean, I think that'd be great to have the dialogue, but, but I think you should count your lucky stars. I think the, the old model of teaching, you know, if we, if we believe even only half of all the alarmist stuff, the old model of teaching is on its way out. And what we're dealing with is, so how the heck do we move forward from here? That's why there is the urgency. That's why there's the need to have it be such a big debate. And that's why a lot of people come out. Uh, I mean, would you feel better if we said, listen, the model of research is really on its way out. There's all this pressure, there all these other people out there doing it a heck of a lot faster, cheaper, and better, and they're getting lots of investment. So you guys are kind of dinosaurs, now figure it out. Um, I'd rather be in a situation, well, you know, the research side, we're okay on that. It's this other stuff where we're going to die if we don't fix it. So I don't know. Uh, let's, let's go after that <laughs> one for a second. Um, the, I would think about it from the point of view that I think it was The Economist this, this week talked about how uh, there are a number of indicators, and whether you believe them all is another question, that innovation is starting to stagnate, that we really haven't seen that kind of healthy, robust research environment that, that we pretend that we may have when we look at the number of patents that are being applied and things like that. And so perhaps there is a parallel call to arms about innovation and research. Uh, if you look at NSF data that talks about the amount of funding that's going to pure research from the federal government, 
as opposed to how industry is picking that up in the context of what is usually referred to as research and development. Perhaps there is some equal challenges that we could uh, recognize as being just as much a, uh, uh, a call to arms as educating our undergraduates. Well, the other problem, I mean, the core problem in a sense is that many of the competitors that are, you're now going to face uh, don't have mixed missions. They don't have a research obligation. Uh, the University of Phoenix doesn't have union faculty. It does not have uh, a research obligation. Uh, so for me, the core question is how do you pay for the research function? And do you pay for it on the backs of undergraduates? That's a, that's a real problem. Uh, because somebody can come in and, and in a hyper environment, a hyper competitive environment, and undercut you by saying, well, we'll do it at a cheaper rate. Now, I, I think the competitive advantage, frankly, is in thinking about research that is done increasingly for our kinds of institutions in the community, in the region, uh, with industry locally rather than necessarily. You know, I mean, uh, NSF, you're, you're going to be up against the Princetons and the Berkeleys. And, and the federal dollars are going to get smaller. That's going to be a tough market. But, but local research is desperately needed for all kinds of local and regional problems, not to mention nano and a lot of other things that are obviously national and global issues. The other thing is building capacity to integrate students into that research it is a strategic advantage that the Phoenixes don't even dream of being able to do. And it's better education. So it's, it, it's, in a sense, it's scaling, getting more productivity out of the sort of models that you create for undergraduate education, engaging students more in, in research and hypothesis development and, and, and real on the ground activities. Uh, and, and those, I think, are going to be competitive advantages. But, but if you simply say, well, we're simply going to do research because that's always been our mission, but we, don't, we haven't figured out how to pay for it, that's going to get to be a, a, a substantial problem down the road. So I, I actually think that a conversation, Rob, like you suggested, um, might, be, might be useful coming down the road. What's the, what, are, what are the characteristics of a research agenda? Uh, and who should be doing it at a place like Portland State? And under what circumstances? And, and if there's a differentiation of faculty, you have a different, I said to somebody a moment ago, you have a differentiation of faculty. We all do. I'm not you. but. Higher ed has a differentiated model of faculty right now. It's called the cool kids and the, and the, and the ones that aren't. Uh, it's called adjuncts, contingents, uh, uh, part-time, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so we already have the model. We just don't play fair in terms of giving people uh, a, a, a stature, because after all, you don't, if you don't have a PhD or whatever it happens to be. You know, you, but we, if we could build a model that said some people are going to do research, and that's cool. But some people are going to do teaching, and that's equally cool. Man, we'd, be, we'd go a long ways towards making this work. Because then we, then we could build a sustainable financial model. We can't do that right now. Uh, early on in this panel, uh, the question was raised about the, the mission that PSU adopted in the, in the early 90s in the context of serving the city. Uh, I'm the only one on the stage here <laughs> that was here when that happened. Um, and one of the things that keeps coming to mind here about these kinds of things is, is that in parallel to that serving the city, another initiative that we worked on very hard for a number of years in that middle 90s period was figuring out a, a set of P&T guidelines. And in that, in our particular guidelines, we worked very hard and there were a number of uh, ad hoc committees that put this together to try to find ways of establishing scholarly agendas that would embody not just a research mission of sponsored research and whatnot, but scholar w w a phrase that we use is the scholarly agenda and looking for figures of merit that would transcend um, sort of simplistic counting and uh, looking at words like significance and contribution to knowledge and things like that, which I think is another hallmark of perhaps that well-kept secret that we've, of PSU exceptionalism, that we've done a number of things in the past 
that really it's time for us to figure out how to celebrate these things and, and, and amplify them and, and stop worrying about whether or not it's Harvard that we're competing about and figure out how our particular mission and how we've been successful at establishing these criteria makes us a place of opportunity for students that wouldn't go to Harvard and make them a place of opportunity for faculty who may not be interested in living in Boston. You know, I mean, I think there's some really beautiful things that happen here that would help us inform a discussion not just about teaching or the polarization between teaching and research, but really get at the point of integrating these things. So I'm going to let our president have the last. Oh, I'm going to let our president have the last word on this, and and then we'll have to wrap up our conversation here. Well, and, and uh, since I started the day with with quotes uh, from a not entirely reputable source, perhaps I thought I would end the day with uh, quotes from a much more reputable source, uh, Hannah Arendt, a uh, philosopher, uh, and it really fits with what what uh, Rob was just saying. And, uh, I'm reading it uh, to get it right. The new always happens against the overwhelming odds of, of statistical loss and their probability, which for all practical everyday purposes amounts to certainty. The new, therefore, always appears in the guise of a miracle. <laughs> so if we think about Portland State exceptionalism, that was the phrase that you used that brought this to mind, is that we have to be in the business of creating a miracle. And that's not easy, and it's going to be unexpected, and we're all going to be surprised, but it's going to be wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. So join me in welcoming my, my guests. You are, now, you are now free to leave the stage. <laughs> so I, I'm going to just do a few things to kind of wrap this up. And I'm going to move out of the way of the screen because we're going to project something on it. Um, and I know there were many more questions that people raised um, and that those questions, again, will be available um, at the Twitter site, but also we will pull those and try to get them on our website as well. Just don't all go to the website at the same time. <laughs> but, um, so, so I do want to talk about sort of at least for those of you who are um, concept proposers a few things, but also for the rest of you in terms of what's next in this particular process. And I want to remind you that remember the provost challenge is just a slice of what we need to be doing in terms of, of rethinking the university. And when we first launched this, one of the things we did talk about a lot was how does this change not only the student experience, but how does it change the nature of faculty work such that faculty might find more time and more opportunities to engage in the research and scholarship that they do. So um, tomorrow and Friday, um, we will be over at University Place starting at 8 o'clock. Um, and the schedule is posted on the website. We welcome any of you to come and listen to the, um, to the proposals that are presented there. What will happen is then we are going to be asking all of the concept proposers to turn their concepts into proposals um, by answering just a few more questions. Uh, and we will be providing that information and it will be available tomorrow on, I'm, I'm looking at Suquant. Um, so Suquant said Friday. <laughs> so on Friday, um, all of the concept um, submitters will get an email from us letting you know that we've opened up a few more fields, not many, a few more fields in the web pages where you're developing your proposals along with a couple of forms that you can then upload so that we get additional information. I do want to continue to remind you to think about working together. The more you work together, the stronger those concepts and proposals will become. And I also remind you that take the feedback that has come from the Twitter feed as well as the feedback people will be giving you at your website in order to, to make those uh, changes. And for those of you who um, are making comments, 
be as critical as possible. I don't mean brutal, but be as critical and helpful as possible so that they benefit of those comments that you have will really help impact the proposals. So a number of people have sort of asked, well, you know, how's, the, how's there going to be a decision about these things? You know, what do you, how's, how's that going to happen? Um, we've been over the course of the last couple of months really developing a set of principles, and I want to share those with you so that you have an understanding of what some of those are. And I also want to let you know that there's not going to be a science to the selection of the awards. But the principles are based on, does the effort fit within PSU's mission and values? Are the goals of the effort to create a better learning environment and success for students? Is the outcome lead to more effective use of resources? As an organization, will we learn from these endeavors and recognize that all ideas might not be implemented? Again, this notion that we really need to experiment and we will have some failures and we will learn along the way. Will we work together across organizational boundaries? What was it, George, that you said? We, we, what do we call ourselves? We, you said some great calcification of... Hardening of categories, right, you know, that sort of, you know, so will, will we work across organizational boundaries? Um, as a, a result of our successful efforts, will we redesign our systems to serve and sustain the changes? And will these changes be driven by the faculty and staff and students at this institution getting to Vim's comment about this, in fact, what we're doing right now is shared governance. So those are some of the principles. So what I'd like to do is um, just leave you with a couple of deadlines here and then just a few more things. So the up and coming deadlines that are important is, is that the fields page will, the new fields will be available on January 17th, 18th, because tomorrow is the 17th, 18th. Um, the completed proposals will need to be done by 5 p.m. on February 15th. We've actually extended the deadline a little bit to give people more time. The campus comments are also due that day as well. So again, we're encouraging everybody to make comments that are helpful to shape these proposals, and the people working on the proposals will continue to work on them up until the, the 15th. Um, what we will then do after that is, is we will take all of that input that we get and the academic leadership team, which includes the deans and the vice provosts and the president's executive committee, will be looking at the proposals as well and providing comment. And it's from all of those comments that we will make a decision on the awards. This isn't going to be a small committee that makes a decision. It's the entire institution by making those comments and providing that input. Um, I do uh, also want to let you know that we will be sending out an evaluation of the symposium so that we can get feedback on what you liked and what you didn't like about today. Um, we won't be asking questions about the lunch. It will be just about the content. The lunch was quite good. Um, and then I think some of the important takeaways, at least for me, and what I'd like to be is an important takeaways from you is, is that you know, we do have an opportunity, but we need to really move fast. And it's, you know, presidents always want to move fast. Provosts typically move a lot slower. I'm right there with Vim on this one. Um, you know, we really do need to move fast, not, not in a reckless way, but what we really need to realize is, is that the world is changing, and we have an opportunity to be part of that change in a very effective way. I am really confident we can do it at Portland State, and it's going to be all the ideas that you have that actually make that happen. So I'd like to thank you for all the work, and I'd like to thank all of you for sticking with it today. Um, we had a great crowd here. We had a lot of people participating on the streaming video, listening or watching and whatever, and it was really great. And uh, you all now deserve to... Go and do the rest of your work that is waiting for you in your offices, I'm sure. Um, so thank you all for coming.